next. A lecture by Noam Chomsky, who's a professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Mr. Chomsky is also the author of books on linguistics, politics, political philosophy, and foreign policy. This semester, Noam Chomsky is a visiting scholar at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, where these remarks took place. His topic, democracy and the media. Okay, let us, uh, let us begin. I'd like to welcome you to the fall 1994 University of Maryland Honors College Visiting Scholar Program. I'm pleased to recognize the participation of the following organizations with the Honors College in the sponsorship of this evening's program. The Humanities Forum, the Offices of Summer and Winter Programs, Residential Life and Campus Activities, and the Student Socialist Forum. It is such occasions as this which bring together into a community of dialogue and learning the diverse constituencies which make UMBC a very stimulating and exciting place to be and which demonstrate to the community at large the value of that dialogue. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to note another such um, occasion which is coming up on the evening of November 12th at 7 p.m when initially in the ballroom here, we'll be showing a uh, video of Anna Devere Smith's Fire in the Mirror, Fires in the Mirror, and then uh, Anna Devere Smith will herself be here to speak on that subject, and we cordially invite you to attend uh, on November 12th at 7 p.m. We're privileged to have with us this evening the world-renowned scholar of linguistics and social critic and analyst Noam Chomsky. Professor Chomsky received his bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees from the University of Pennsylvania. He currently holds the very prestigious position of institute professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he has been a member of the faculty since 1955. A recipient of numerous awards, Professor Chomsky has taught and lectured at Columbia University, Oxford, Cambridge, and the University of Leiden, among other places. And he has been a member of the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton University. The list of his publications displays well over 50 books which he has authored or co-authored. Among them are Syntactic Structures, Language and Mind for Reasons of State, The Logical Structure of Linguistic Theory, Manufacturing <coughs> Consent, The Political Economy of the Mass Media, and Necessary Illusions, Thought Control in Democratic Societies. Professor Chomsky's fields of intellectual endeavor might at first seem rather disparate, but a studied consideration of both soon demonstrates that the one is a logical and natural complement of the other. As a proponent of generative grammar, he is deeply concerned with how we come to symbolize our thoughts for their transmission from mind to mind. As a critic of the artificial media through which those symbols are often transmitted, he is deeply concerned with the responsibility of the powers which operate those media. The linguist deals with the operation of this system in the individual, the critic deals with a version of this system as it is magnified and operates in the body politic. Some time ago, we had a rather rude awakening to discover that the distinction between the message and the medium through which it is transmitted can become blurred, in some cases quite noxiously so. Apropos of this, Professor Chomsky opens his book Manufacturing Consent as follows. The mass media serve as a system for communicating messages and symbols to the general populace. It is their function to amuse, entertain, and inform, and to inculcate individuals with the values, beliefs, and codes of behavior that will integrate them into the institutional structures of the larger society. Whether it is the questionable but unquestioned values and logic of a 5th century BC Athenian rhetorician, the honeyed words of a 1st century BC Roman poet smeared on the rim of a cup of otherwise unpalatable doctrine, or the irony of a carefully designed media facade behind which lurk the ulterior and perhaps also inferior motives of the facade builders, we are ever in need of that gadfly spirit which, whether it gains our agreement or not, does, does us the great service of making us think about what is beneath the surface, about how and why what is said is said. In the last analysis about appearance and reality, our honored guest this evening is such a gadfly. Please join me in welcoming Professor Noam Chomsky, who will speak on democracy and media in the New World Order. <laughs> 
Thanks. Uh, there's a uh, conventional doctrine about the new era that's opening up before us and uh, the promise that it holds. The official version of this was given about a year ago by the National Security Advisor, Anthony Lake, uh, announcing what some have called the Clinton Doctrine. Uh, the doctrine is that we are now able to move from containment, which we did in the old days, to enlargement, which is what we're now going to do. In his words, throughout the Cold War, we contained the global threat to market democracies. Now we should seek to enlarge their reach uh, with the evil empire out of the way. Uh, and commentators were much impressed by this enlightened vision. The story is so familiar that I'll spare you further quotes. Uh, although when you move to the uh, higher levels of the intellectual stratosphere, they do have a certain interest and maybe are worth a brief sample. So for example, take say Henry Kissinger in his recent book, uh, he repeats the standard refrain that the world is lucky indeed to have such a uh, benevolent leader, uh, but he warns that uh, we may be a little too angelic for our own good. Uh, altruism is okay up to a point, but the altruism of U.S. policy is beginning to be somewhat harmful, or maybe always has been. In other words, we should pay some attention to our own needs instead of just um, lavishing care and attention on uh, everyone else. Uh, sometimes this, uh, uh, this point of this uh, conception of the tradition and the new world order uh, actually rises higher than mere uh, opinion or uh, description of fact. Uh, sometimes it reaches the realms of pure logic, uh, but here you really have to go to uh, the higher level. So, for example, there's a position at Harvard called the Eaton Professorship of the Science of Government, uh, now held by Samuel Huntington. Uh, he uh, writes in a prestigious journal, International Security, that the United States must maintain its international primacy for the benefit of the world because uh, alone among nations, uh, the national identity of the United States is defined by a set of universal political and economic values, uh, liberty, democracy, equality, private property, and markets. Well, uh, since that's a matter of definition, so the science of government teaches us, uh, evidence is beside the point. So you don't waste time testing, doing experiments to find out if two and two is really equal to four. And that's a kind of a useful conclusion because if people don't understand it, they might be tempted to raise some rather disquieting questions uh, to pick just, say, the period of uh, the peak period of American liberalism, take, say, the Kennedy administration. And somebody might want to know just how the Kennedy administration was containing the uh, global threat to market democracies when it prepared the overthrow of the parliamentary uh, government of Brazil, installing a regime of uh, killers and torturers, and setting off a plague of neo-Nazi national security states that spread over the hemisphere, uh, always with firm US support and, in fact, direct participation. And indeed, the actions were presented at the time as a great victory for democracy. Uh, Kennedy's ambassador, Lincoln Gordon, uh, uh, who then became uh, uh, Secretary of State for Asian Affairs, uh, he explained that the Brazilian coup, a military coup that overthrew the parliamentary regime, uh, was uh, uh, a great victory for the free world, uh, which was undertaken to preserve and not destroy Brazil's democracy. It was, he called it a democratic revolution, which was the single most decisive victory for freedom in the mid-20th century. And then he added that also it should create a greatly improved climate for private investment. Uh, so in that sense, at least, it did contain a threat to market democracy, democracy in a rather special sense. Uh, he went on from there, to, if my memory is correct, uh, to become president of a great university, uh, not very far from here. Uh, well, we uh, 
also would not have to evaluate other cases, given that the U.S. commitment to these splendid values is a matter of definition. In fact, we can put aside the whole historical record, uh, which unfortunately reveals a rather systematic relationship between U.S. policy and uh, democracy and human rights and indeed markets. I'll come to that. Uh, one example is the close correlation that's been demonstrated repeatedly between U.S. aid and torture. Uh, the more a government tortures its citizens, uh, the more likely it is to receive U.S. aid. Uh, the uh, correlation uh, includes military aid. It's independent of need. It's not just that the torturing countries are the needier. Uh, and the correlation remains alive right through the period when human rights was the soul of our foreign policy uh, back in the late 1970s. And indeed, the correlation remains quite alive today, uh, notably in the region that's most subject to U.S. power and therefore most revealing about our real values. Uh, the uh, leading human rights violator in the hemisphere now, first place has been taken by Colombia, uh, where the record is really horrendous. Uh, and in fact, it is the recipient of more than half of U.S. military aid increasing under Clinton. Now, the pretext in Colombia is not fighting communism. That doesn't work anymore. It's fighting narco-trafficking, although nobody even, at least nobody even tries to conceal the fact that the security course forces that the United States is training and arming and the government itself is deeply involved with narco-trafficking, which indeed has been abetted by U.S. policy in some quite remarkable ways. If there's time, I'll give some examples. Uh, but the uh, useful point is that any such questions are irrelevant if indeed the commitment to uh, democracy and markets and human rights and all good things is simply a matter of definition. Well, I don't want to imply that everyone thinks that facts are irrelevant, that it's just a matter of logic. That's unfair. So let's say take democracy. Uh, there is, in fact, interesting work on democracy and human and U.S. policy with regard to democracy, particularly in the recent years. Uh, some of the most interesting work I know is scholarly work is by uh, 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 a man named Thomas Carruthers, who's written a book and several articles about it, uh, studies of U.S. relations to democracy in the 1980s. And he has the advantage of writing as an insider. He was in the State Department the Reagan State Department, working on the legal, legal subdepartment, working in particular on the what are called what they call the democracy enhancement programs. So he writes both as an observer and as a participant, uh, and it's and the study is interesting. He he uh, starts by pointing out that he's convinced that the effort U.S. effort to enhance democracy in Latin America was sincere, but unfortunately it was a failure. Uh, and as he points out, he doesn't point this out, but as the record shows, and he presents it quite honestly, the failure is rather systematic, oddly systematic. Uh, the way it works is that where U.S. influence was least, uh, progress towards democracy was greatest, uh, namely in the southern cone, where the, you know, down far south, where the U.S. had least interest, uh, influence. There, there was indeed progress toward democracy. Uh, the Reaganites strenuously opposed it, as Carruthers accurately points out, and then, of course, took credit for it once it became irreversible. Well, that's where U.S. interest was least, influence was least. Where U.S. influence was greatest uh, in Central America, progress was least. Uh, here, as uh, I'll just quote you Carruthers', Carruthers own conclusion, these are the programs he was involved in, incidentally. Uh, Washington inevitably sought only limited top-down forms of democratic change that did not risk upsetting the traditional structures of power with which the United States has long been allied. The United States, he said, sought to maintain the basic uh, order of quite undemocratic societies and to avoid populist-based change that might upset established economic and political orders and open a leftist uh, direction. Uh, in other words, we sponsored democracy as long as it came out the way we ordered it to come out, uh, with the old uh, non-democratic structure remaining and the anti-democratic elites that were allied to U.S. power in charge. Otherwise, we didn't sponsor it. In fact, we're observing that again right now before our eyes. Uh, in many places, Haiti's a dramatic example if you look 
at what's really happening. Uh, when we turn to the real world, away from the world of ideology, uh, I think we find that democracy and markets and human rights are under serious attack in much of the world, more so than for many years, including the leading industrial democracies. Uh, the most powerful of them, the United States, is in fact leading the attack. And in the real world, the United States has never supported free markets from its earliest history until the Reagan years, which in fact set new standards for protectionism and state intervention in the economy, contrary to many illusions, uh, which in fact are fostered by the ideological institutions but are easily demonstrated to be false. Uh, if for an entry into the real world, I, uh, I would a good place to start is uh, with a noted diplomatic historian named Gerald Haynes, also the senior historian of the CIA. So again, he writes both as a scholar and then close to the inside. Uh, he recently published a highly praised book on U.S. control of Brazil for the last 50 years, uh, ever since the mid-40s when the United States, as he puts it, took Brazil over as a testing area uh, for scientific methods of development. And we've been essentially running it ever since, including uh, the great victory for democracy that took place when, uh, in, uh, uh, during the Kennedy-Johnson period that I already mentioned. Uh, Haynes, writing in 1989, uh, describes this result as a great success story for American-style capitalism. Uh, now that's an interesting judgment if you happen to know anything about Brazil, uh, where a very potentially very rich country, ought to be one of the richest in the world, uh, where for maybe 90% of the population, uh, the conditions of Eastern Europe uh, under uh, pre-Gorbachev uh, would look like some kind of paradise. Uh, now that's actually an interesting comparison if you ask yourself how Brazil compared with Russia 70 years ago, actually rather similar, with similar prospects. Uh, uh, and uh, you can draw some conclusions from that, but you can be safe and secure that those conclusions won't be drawn uh, in mainstream discussion, uh, where the only thing that's discussed is uh, the comparison of Eastern Europe and Western Europe. Uh, showing how great we are and how awful they are, which is about as rational as uh, a discussion of the uh, nursery schools in Cambridge, Massachusetts, showing that they're a total failure, as you can see by comparing uh, the amount of quantum physics known by graduates of the nursery schools with what's known by graduates of MIT. Uh, in fact, if you want to make even a rational, minimally rational comparison of these two models of development, the one we carried out in the testing area for scientific development and the tyrannical command economy of Eastern Europe, the, the only way to do it, of course, is to start with places that are more or less alike. Uh, Eastern and Western Europe, the last time they were alike was about the 15th century, I guess, uh, and Eastern Europe have been declining <coughs> relative to the West ever since. Uh, on the other hand, say, Brazil and Russia were more or less alike, uh, although Brazil had all sorts of advantages <coughs> that Russia never had. Well, I won't pursue that. As I say, that's a rational course. You can find some material on that, but not in the mainstream. Uh, anyhow, back to Haynes. Uh, he begins by pointing out that, I'm quoting, following World War II, the United States assumed out of self-interest responsibility for the welfare of the world capitalist system. Uh, and as any CEO can explain to you, welfare for the leaders of the world capitalist system requires a dual policy with regard to markets. Uh, free markets for the poor and the oppressed, but massive state intervention to protect the wealthy and the privileged from market discipline, to make sure that resources are transferred to them by a huge public subsidy, and by regressive fiscal measures, and also to increase the power of, it requires increasing the power of absolutist and unaccountable institutions over the international economy and society, and indeed that's exactly what policy has been. Uh, as for democracy, it's a fine thing uh, as long as uh, it satisfies uh, the conditions that uh, Carruthers describes, that is top-down form of democracy in which the rule is safely in the hands of elite groups linked to the United States, which are indeed highly uh, 
highly uh, autocratic. Uh, the condition under which democracy is acceptable was actually described rather honestly by the London Economist a little while ago. Uh, they were uh, writing, this was right after the Polish elections, uh, where the Poles had uh, voted to uh, against the policies that the London Economist and its readers favor. And they said that that's no problem. They assured their readers that that's no problem. The reason is, as they put it, that policy is insulated from politics. In other words, whatever games these people play in the election booth, in the voting booth, policy is going to go on the same way, so don't worry about it. And the reason is that what's happening, uh, that much more powerful forces are going to determine policy anyway, so they can have democracy if they like, because they're going to do what we want anyway. Uh, the, uh, uh, to borrow some World Bank lingo, uh, policy can be carried out in what, what they like to call technocratic insulation. That is, with the guys who really run the show uh, following the orders of real power and ignoring the uh, uh, noises that come from the rabble. In that case, we can have democracy. Well, the current attack on human rights and democracy and markets is not something new, but it is taking new forms, in fact, qualitatively different ones, I think. Uh, uh, to show that convincingly would be a, you know, way beyond anything I can attempt here. But uh, what I'll try to do is just to indicate why I think that these conclusions are correct, and then maybe we can follow things up in discussion. Uh, let me begin with a lead story in the New York Times that appeared in July uh, under the headline, U.S. corporations expanding abroad at a quicker pace. And it starts off like this. It says, American companies are once again rapidly expanding their operations abroad, demonstrating that no matter what the incentives for keeping business in the United States, the urge to spread factories, offices, stores, and jobs overseas is irresistible. Uh, despite a weak dollar and falling labor costs here, which you would think would spur investment here, Overseas investment is rising at twice the rate of exports, and for each dollar earned from exports, American companies take in nearly two dollars from the sale of what they produce abroad. Well, let's begin with the falling labor costs, which indeed are quite real. Uh, about 10 years ago, the United States had the highest wages in the world, which is what you'd expect. This is the richest country in the world by far, and it has absolutely unparalleled advantages. Uh, real wages have, in fact, stagnated or even declined for the majority of the population since their peak around 25 years ago. But uh, in the mid-80s, the effects of the double-edged uh, so-called conservatism of the Reaganites, namely markets for the poor and state protection for the rich, uh, that hadn't yet had its full impact. Uh, by 1993, the impact was quite obvious. The Wall Street Journal was able to exult over what it called a welcome development of transcendent importance, namely U.S. labor costs had fallen below all other leading industrial powers uh, apart from England. We actually did fall below England for a while, but then Margaret Thatcher succeeded in driving uh, the uh, working people and the poor down even more efficiently than us. Uh, meanwhile, profits were rising to new heights. Uh, earlier this year, every year, Fortune magazine has a, you know, the big business magazine, has a review of the Fortune 500, you know, the 500 top guys. Uh, and this year, earlier this year, they reported uh, dazzling profits, that's their word, for the 500 top corporations, even though sales were stagnating. So wages are going down, sales are stagnating, and profits are zooming to dazzling heights. Uh, sometimes called a paradox. Uh, in fact, if you look at social <laughs> policy, it's not terribly paradoxical. Uh, in a, uh, there are other things happening, too, along with decline in wages for the majority of the population, and that continues through the so-called recovery. Uh, work hours are increasing. They're now at the highest level since the Second World <coughs> War. The 40-hour week has long been forgotten. Uh, and markets are becoming more flexible. It's a technical term which means that when you go to sleep at night, you don't know if you're going to have a job next morning. That's, uh, as any economist can explain to you, that's a contribution to the health of the economy. It's a contribution to the health of the economy when you eliminate what are called market rigidities. 
like job security and con you know, contracts, uh, pensions, uh, union uh, laws, uh, governing health, uh, safety in the workplace, and so on. Those are all market rigidities which we want to eliminate uh, in the interest of the health of the economy. Health of the economy is a carefully defined term uh, designed so that it refers to certain factors, it brings in certain factors and not others, including not the factors that even the World Bank concedes are major factors in economic growth like equality. Uh, it's an economy it can be very healthy by this measure uh, while the population is in fact suffering miserably. In fact, that happens constantly and there's even another technical term for that. Uh, it's, a call, it's called an, uh, an economic miracle. It means the privileged few are doing beautifully, the numbers look fine, foreign investors are enriching themselves, and the population may be starving to death. Uh, well, these developments uh, are welcome to uh, other sectors of uh, the world capitalist system for whose welfare the United States has provided, as the senior historian of the CIA puts it. Uh, one immediate effect of the free trade agreement with Canada was the flight of several hundred thousand jobs to the southeast United States, uh, where labor markets are very flexible. There's no need for concern about such archaic ideas as unions or benefits or uh, security uh, or for that matter for the rights that are guaranteed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to which we make you know, proper obeisance when there's some political uh, gains to be made from that uh, and other laws and conventions. And the news of course reached Europe as well including Germany uh, where labor costs per unit output were 60 percent, are 60 percent higher than the United States, according to the Wall Street Journal. Uh, just at that time, Germany's largest conglomerate, Daimler-Benz, established a major factory in Alabama uh, where it was offered the usual benefits that are expected from third world countries uh, at a cost to the taxpayer that was considered exorbitant even by the Wall Street Journal, which rarely has a harsh word for foreign investment. Uh, overseas investment is motivated by more than the availability of cheap labor with few benefits and rights, that is, flexible markets, labor markets. And that's explained in the same New York Times article that I quoted from earlier. Uh, in it, uh, the Times interviews uh, an executive of the Gillette company, you know, the Gillette Razor Company, uh, and he explained why his corporation is shifting production to 28 countries, including Germany, despite its very high labor costs. And here's the reason. Uh, we're concerned about having only one place where a product is made because of labor problems. And he gives an example. Example is they have a factory in Boston, and if the Boston workers strike, uh, Gillette could supply both the European and the U.S. markets from its plant in Berlin and thereby break the strike. So it's quite reasonable that uh, Gillette should employ three times as many workers uh, in manufacture abroad as in the United States, quite irrespective of costs. Notice that this is not for economic efficiency, so they're going to high cost areas. Rather, it's just part of uh, class war. Uh, it's a way to maintain power uh, and, to in, uh, and to ensure that the highly class conscious business sector in the United States uh, will be able to beat down its enemy, namely the domestic population. Uh, uh, this is quite apart from questions of economic efficiency, notice, except in a much longer, you know, something in some other sense <coughs> of the term. Uh, the, this, uh, these processes, sometimes these inter international, internationalization of production, uh, which is going on, of which this is an illustration, uh, that puts quite a different cast on the uh, discussion that's underway these days, the debate about what's called American decline. Uh, it means that in order, it, it indicates, as it was always true, but now it's much more tr true, that if you want to evaluate the notion of American decline, you have to begin by saying what you mean by the United States. What is it? Uh, if you mean by the United States the geographical entity and the people in it, then indeed the country is declining in many respects. But uh, as Adam Smith observed two centuries ago, the principal architects of state policy in his days, the merchants and manufacturers of England have quite different interests than those of their own, of the population of their country. And they make sure that their own interests are, in his words, most peculiarly attended to uh, 
whatever the effect on their own populations, let alone others. And nothing has changed in that regard, including the need to employ the class analysis that Adam Smith took for granted uh, in understanding policy choices. Incidentally, I'm talking about the real Adam Smith, not the one who is created by ideologues. The real one is actually quite interesting, not the imbecile it sounds like when you look at what's attributed to him. Uh, the, uh, uh, so we have to at least begin by recognizing what was a truism to Adam Smith, that when we talk about policy, we have to ask, are we talking about the principal architects, no longer the merchants and manufacturers, but now basically transnational corporations and banks and so on, or are we talking about the population in the country? And you just get quite different answers. So for example, if you uh, use, if you refer to the principal architects of policy, it's quite natural to discover that uh, U.S. manufacturing production is indeed declining, namely when you consider the geographical entity, but it's holding its own quite well uh, if you consider the share in global production of U.S.-based corporations, just different concepts of the United States. Uh, so all is fine, in other words, if you adopt the perspective of the principal architects of policy. And the same conclusions hold with regard to the famous trade deficit. If you consider international borders, the United States has a huge, huge trade deficit, and it's expected to go up, in fact. But recently, the Commerce Department recalculated the trade deficit on a different way. They counted profits of U.S. companies abroad as U.S. exports. Well, when you did that, the deficit turned into a huge surplus. And that recalculation was quite reasonable, the Wall Street Journal explained in reporting it, because the profits gained abroad benefit companies domestically. Uh, so therefore, uh, they should be regarded as like, imp, you know, exports, basically. Uh, the recalculation interprets the words United States in the terms that matter for the principal architects of policy in Adam Smith's sense not the geographical area for its people, but rather the people who count, that is, the beneficiaries of the powerful welfare state for the rich, which indeed was enhanced under the Reagan years. Uh, the end of the Cold War provides rich new opportunities for, uh, for increasing the privilege and power of Western investors. Partly that's simply because much of the region is being returned to its traditional third world service role. In my opinion, that's what the Cold War was basically about, but that's another topic. I'll put it aside. Uh, in any event, that's plainly happening. Uh, it's going back, most of it, to where it was relative to the West about 70 years ago, uh, and for Eastern Europe 50 years ago. Uh, also, uh, these developments offer uh, the principal architects of policy and the institutions they represent it offers them new weapons against their domestic enemy, namely the population at home, and that's quite an important matter. Uh, workers in the East are skilled and healthy and well-educated, uh, although that, in fact, is changing because of the precipitous uh, and disastrous decline in quality of life standards in most of Eastern Europe since 1989 as the capitalist reforms were imposed, and they, in fact, were returned to the third world where they're supposed to be. Uh, UNESCO has a recent report in which they try to give some num put some numbers on this, and they estimate, for example, about half a million extra deaths a year in Russia alone as a result of uh, these measures, which, incidentally, they say they approve of, uh, though not the way they're carried out. The workers in the East, nevertheless, still are they may not remain, but they still are skilled and uh, uh, well-educated. And of course, they're also blonde and blue-eyed, which overcomes another unspoken problem about the third world. Uh, they're willing to work longer hours than what the business press calls their pampered colleagues in, in the West. Uh, thanks to pauperization and massive unemployment, resulting from the free market reforms. I'm quoting the London Financial Times in a kind of an upbeat column uh, about the East uh, headed green shoots in communism's ruins. Now, this is pretty awful, but there's some green shoots like the pauperization and mass unemployment, uh, which means that they'll work much harder than their pampered, than pampered Western workers. Uh, they don't receive many benefits, nice flexible labor market, and wages are kept low by 
harsh labor policies of the powerful states doing their job. Uh, meanwhile, foreign investors benefit additionally from tariff protection, subsidies, uh, tax holidays, and the other familiar concomitants of really existing free market policies. So when GM and VW and so on move to Eastern Europe, they expect and get massive protection because that's their sense of free markets. Well, the business press has been quite frank in warning Western workers that they're going to have to abandon what Business Week calls their luxurious lifestyle in the face of international competition, now including uh, the traditional third world in the East, returning to its service role. Uh, when economists talk about this, they usually talk about job shift and then point out rightly that we don't know a lot about that, but that's the least of it. Uh, the threat of job shift alone suffices to make labor markets more flexible, that is to lower wages, eliminate benefits, and so on uh, in a more internationalized economy for obvious reasons. Uh, and all of these devices provide new methods uh, for the powerful to enhance their wealth and privilege, which is, after all, what social policy is about, uh, and their decision-making power in all aspects of life, and indeed their control over the general population. And that's true whether democratic forms function or not, uh, given that policy can increasingly be insulated from politics. Uh, well, over the last century and a half, workers have won many rights for themselves and for the general population in long and hard struggles. In the United States, they faced levels of state corporate violence that were unique in the West. Uh, but in the United States, these rights have been eroded and by now have almost been completely destroyed by a major state corporate offensive starting right after World War II. Uh, ever since the Reaganite takeover, the offensive simply became open partnership in crime. Uh, employers simply violated the law, frankly and openly, secure in the knowledge that they'd be backed by a criminal state. Uh, all of this, incidentally, is reviewed in some detail and quite accurately in Business Week uh, in a cover story last May, which you might want to have a look at. Uh, the conclusion is that crime does pay, particularly when state power is behind it. That's a principle that's understood very well by our clients abroad as well. As for the global social and economic crisis, it's quite real, uh, and we feel people feel it and they feel it rightly, uh, uh, often it's recognized, in fact, and it's usually attributed to inexorable market forces, forces which uh, uh, of the kind that Ri David Ricardo uh, called as immutable as the principles of gravitation and an earlier exercise of ideological warfare when classical economics was sort of created. Uh, recognizing these inexorable forces, you then get division among analysts about the contribution of various factors like international trade and automation, those are some of the major ones. Well, putting aside the absurdity of comparing human institutions uh, with their specific values and choices to laws of nature, it should be recognized that there's a considerable element of deception in all of this. If you look closely, you find that the alleged efficiencies of trade and automation, for example, are hardly attributable to the market. Uh, huge state subsidies and state intervention have always been required and still are to make trade appear to be efficient, uh, not to speak of costs such as, for example, ecological costs that are imposed on future generations who don't vote in the market and other so-called externalities which are put down in footnotes somewhere. Well, to mention merely one slight market distortion, which doesn't get discussed much in talk about the efficiency of trade, uh, a substantial part of the Pentagon budget has been devoted uh, to, I'm quoting, secure flow of oil at reasonable prices from the Middle East, which is overwhelmingly the preserve of the United States. Uh, I'm quoting from Phoebe Marr of the National Defense University in a casual and quite correct comment in a scholarly journal, uh, if you were watching uh, television during the latest Iraq escapade, you'll recall that she was one of the main specialists called upon to give uh, uh, explanations of what's happening. Well, the Pentagon budget, uh, which is not slight, 
is a contribution to the efficiency of trade that doesn't receive too much attention, uh, apart from other contributions that it makes to what's called the health of the economy, and there are plenty of other such factors. If you consider them, you get quite a different picture. Uh, let's take automation, the second factor. Uh, there's no doubt that it uh, is throwing people out of work these days, and it does contribute to profit today. Uh, however, automation was so inefficient that it could not be developed through market forces. Uh, it had to be developed through decades of protection in the state sector. Uh, that's what's called here the defense system. That's just the state sector of the economy, which the public pays for until something profitable comes out, at which point it's handed over to private power. Uh, this uh, has been studied very extensively and very revealingly by David Noble, formerly of my university, now in Canada. Uh, works very much worth reading. And furthermore, as he demonstrates, uh, the specific form of automation that was selected uh, was not inherent in the technology, it, nor was it picked for reasons of economic efficiency. Uh, often the choice was driven by power rather than profit or efficiency or anything that's in the technology. That is, the form of automation that was developed within the state sector, protected uh, because of its enormous inefficiency, uh, the form of automation that was developed was designed to de-skill workers and subordinate them to management, not the contrary, to give work, to empower workers and eliminate management. Uh, the uh, same technology, the technology doesn't care which way it's used, it could be used one way or the other, and questions of profit are basically irrelevant to this question. Uh, what is relevant are questions of domination and control, uh, um, like, for example, Gillette's buildup of a labor force in Berlin uh, in case American workers get the crazy idea of striking. Uh, what is in fact happening in the world uh, has less to do with markets than it does with raw concentrated power and class war of the kind that was obvious to Adam Smith. Uh, increasingly, this power is vested in unaccountable institutions. Uh, there are changes in the international economy that have offered real hopes for reversing uh, and unraveling the advances in democracy and human rights that had been uh, achieved in more than a century of bitter struggle. Uh, one factor is just the internationalization of the economy, which, which uh, offers very effective weapons against working people, as, as I mentioned, as is obvious. Uh, another factor, which sort of goes along in parallel with that, is the huge explosion uh, in uh, unregulated speculative financial capital, uh, and also which has just ex exploded since around 1970 when the regulatory system was dismantled by Richard Nixon, the Bretton Woods system. Uh, and uh, not only has the scale grown enormously, but so has the, it, the composition. So current estimates are that around 1970, about 90 percent of the capital of, involved in international exchanges was for uh, was trade related or investment related that is related to some sort of meaningful economic purpose and about 10 percent was speculation like speculation against currencies by 1990 those those numbers had literally reversed 90 percent speculation not anything productive uh, and the latest report I saw on a UN development policy uh, program report just a few months ago is that that figure has now gone up to 95 percent. Well, the difference between 10 percent uh, devoted to uh, uh, mere speculation and 95 percent devoted to it is great, uh, apart from the fact that the scale is, has become completely astronomical. Uh, and that has its consequences. Uh, it creates massive pressures leading towards uh, low growth, low wage, uh, dazzling profit economies and it helps insulate policy from politics uh, and eliminate the threat of democracy. That's what's being referred to when people talk about technocratic insulation and the fact that democracy isn't as much of a fear anymore because there's nothing much people do about it anyway. Uh, power lies in other hands. Unaccountable, uh, essentially totalitarian institutions have the kind of power that uh, was never dreamt of in the past. Well, I think that's what's really happening lot of work on this. In fact, uh, without instead of talking at this abstract level, let's go down to earth. The real meaning 
of what's called free market conservatism is illustrate, uh, illustrated by a closer look at the uh, most passionate enthusiasts for what they call getting the government off our back and letting the market reign undisturbed. You know, those are the mantras these days as you read every day. Uh, well, New York Times had a front page story on this interesting phenomenon a little while ago, and they picked a concrete example, and indeed the most striking example, uh, Cobb County, Georgia. Uh, the article appears under the heading, Conservatism Flowering Among the Malls. That's what's happening in Cobb County, Georgia. It's a rich suburb of Atlanta, uh, scrupulously insulated from any urban infection so that the inhabitants can enjoy the fruits of what is described as their entrepreneurial values and their market enthusiasms, uh, they're defended, which are defended in Congress by their representative, uh, the leading conservative in Congress, Newt Gingrich, next Speaker of the House, I presume, who, who is uh, proudly proclaiming that the anti-government sentiments of the American people are finally beginning to prevail over the socialistic uh, welfare state uh, well, there is a small footnote to this. Cobb County, Georgia, uh, receives more federal subsidies than any other county in the country, uh, with two interesting exceptions. One of them is, Arling uh, is uh, uh, Arlington, Virginia, which is, of course, just part of the federal system. Uh, and the other is the Florida home of the Kennedy State, uh, Space Center, which is another central component of the system of public subsidy of... Uh, private profit. But if you move out of the state system itself, so put aside those two counties, uh, then Cobb County is the leading recipient of federal subsidies, public subsidies funneled through the federal government in the country. The leading employer in Cobb County is Lockheed Aircraft, a corporation which exists thanks to massive public subsidy. Uh, most other jobs in Cobb County where people are pursuing their entrepreneurial values uh, uh, also are uh, based on feeding at the public trough, meaning the taxpayers paying for them. Uh, meanwhile, praises to market miracles are resounding to the heavens, uh, notably where conservatism is flowering among the malls, uh, along with calls to get the government off our back, as long as it, it, we're sure that its hands are pouring public funds into our pockets. Uh, well, uh, if, I, uh, you, if you want to very graphic illustration of how this works, I really urge you to look at Newt Gingrich's uh, contract with America, uh, parts of which are published in the New York Times this morning. I could read it on the airplane coming down. Uh, if you read it, uh, you discover, not uh, just a little bit closely, it doesn't take very closely, you discover that what he's calling for is a greatly enhanced and much more powerful welfare state for the rich, uh, but with punishment of the poor. And in fact, it's done in a pretty brazen fashion. It's worth reading carefully. And in fact, that pattern is almost exceptionless. So one sort of minor part of the welfare state for the rich is just straight, flat, outright welfare, uh, whether it's ma sometimes masked in re regressive fiscal measures, but what amounts to just payments. Uh, and uh, what you find, I uh, just read a recent study by one economist that uh, 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 if, if for a household with incomes over 100,000, uh, welfare subsidies fr for, from the government are about almost twice as high as for households with income of under 10,000. Now, these subsidies include things like, uh, you know, say, tax reductions for mortgage payments and so on, which are equivalent to subsidies. Might as well just give people the money. It's just a way of disguising it so others don't see it. Uh, now, that's the small part of it. Uh, but even there alone, we find that the welfare to the rich is well beyond uh, anything that goes to the poor. Uh, so the welfare system is, in fact, a redistributed system upwards, uh, something which wouldn't have surprised Adam Smith, who understood that that's what the principal architects of policy are up to. However, if you really want to see the way the system works, you have to move from these sort of minor parts to places like Cobb County, Georgia, uh, or, say, Seattle, Washington, uh, where uh, 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 you could observe it quite closely last year. Uh, Bill Clinton is off to Jakarta next week, or week or two, for the next APEC conference, uh, side comment. Uh, he 
ma uh, made it clear that he's not going to bring up any human rights issues. Uh, Indonesia has a horrendous human rights record. If you want to have a look at what it's like, take a look at the latest Amnesty International report, uh, which is unusual. I mean, I've rarely seen such a harsh and well-justified report, in fact. Uh, in addition to that, it's uh, carried out a near genocidal attack on East Timor and is still doing it. Uh, I just picked up a flyer coming in here saying that on Thursday, November 10th, at 5 o'clock, uh, here I guess, or at the Indonesian Embassy, there's to be a candlelight vigil. Uh, it's the anniversary of one of the big massacres a couple of years ago, the Dili Massacre, 1991. Uh, Indonesia at that point made an error. In case some of you are thinking of a career in the diplomatic service, I give you some free advice. You're not supposed to carry out massacres in front of television cameras. Uh, and there happened to be a hidden television camera there. There's a British journalist who's hiding behind a gravestone in the graveyard where the massacre took place. That's a bad mistake. And second point, you're not supposed to practically murder American journalists. Uh, and the Indonesian troops uh, practically killed an American journalist, Alan Nairn, uh, while I was, he was trying to protect a friend. Uh, Amy Goodman, another American journalist. That's a bad mistake. That's considered bad form. You're not supposed to do that. Uh, and when you do that, there's a routine that you go through, uh, cover-up, uh, judicial cover-up, uh, punishment of the victims, uh, free the people who are responsible. And then there's another job. This is advice for those of you who want to be journalists or academics and so on. You're supposed to praise this magnificent display uh, that shows how you know, human rights are improving and it's really a wonderful place and so on and so forth. I mean, this is a record that is replayed over and over and it was done on, in that case, if you don't happen to like it, you can, for example, join the vigil. Uh, well, uh, next week, uh, so two weeks, I guess, Clinton's off to Jakarta where he's promised not to say anything about human rights. Uh, the last APEC conference, uh, um, Asia-Pacific Economic uh, Conference or whatever it's called, the last one a year ago was in Seattle, and there Clinton was the star performer. Uh, he offered what the press described uh, with great awe as his grand vision of the free market future, uh, a lot of admiration. Uh, he gave the talk announcing this grand vision in a hangar of the Boeing Corporation in Seattle. And in fact, he selected Boeing as his model, the model of the free market future. Uh, and it's a makes some sense. Boeing is the country's leading ex exporter. And in fact, civilian air aircraft uh, leads the way in U.S. manufacturing exports. The world's biggest industry, the tourism industry, is of course aircraft-based. Uh, and it accounts for about a third of the U.S. trade surplus in services. So it makes good sense to pick Boeing. Uh, Boeing also happens to be a perfect example of state-supported industry. Boeing is a publicly subsidized, like Lockheed, publicly subsidized corporation, which the taxpayer pays for, but the profits go to the investors. That's our system. That's what we call free enterprise uh, and getting the government off your backs. So Boeing was a great choice. Uh, if this never, nobody seemed to notice this when they were talking about the green, grand vision for the future, but it's an interesting story. Uh, if you look at the history, Boeing, the leading exporter, Pre before World War II, it, couldn't, it could barely survive. Uh, during World War II, however, uh, its uh, investment increased fivefold, uh, over 90% of it uh, federal money. This is while Boeing was doing its uh, patriotic duty during the Second World War and wages were being held down for others doing their patriotic duty. So after World War II, Boeing was in business, uh, not through the forces of the market. Well, what happened after the war? Uh, Fortune magazine, the leading business magazine, recognized right off, I'm quoting it, that the aircraft industry cannot satisfactorily exist in a pure, uncompetitive, unsubsidized, free enterprise economy. And uh, Business Week added that the government is their only possible savior. And in fact, the Pentagon system was revitalized as the savior. It sustained and expanded the aircraft industry, the leading civilian exporter, uh, along with a lot of others that went along with it. For example, uh, metals generally, uh, electronics, computers, about 85% of 
uh, electronics are research and development during the 50s was paid for by the taxpayer. The profits later went to private corporations. Uh, that includes chemicals, machine tools, um, automation, as I mentioned, and in fact, just about every other central component of the industrial economy. Incidentally, the fact that the government had to be the savior, meaning the taxpayer had to pay for it, uh, for the enrichment of the wealthy and the maintenance of a private enterprise economy, that was completely frank and open in the business press, was never concealed. Uh, you don't have to go to secret records to discover it. All you have to do is read the business press in the late 40s. Very clear. Uh, it's also supported by released secret documents, uh, but there's nothing much to reveal. The first secretary of, except for the general population, who was not supposed to hear any of this, uh, the first secretary of the Air Force, uh, Stuart Symington, uh, he put the matter quite plainly in January 1948. He said, the word to talk is not subsidy. The word to talk is security. Uh, listen to the word and you'll learn a lot about recent history, including the Cold War. Uh, Symington was essentially aircraft industry representative in Washington, and he regularly demanded enough procurement funds from Congress uh, to, as he put it, meet the requirements of the aircraft industry. And in fact, Boeing won the major share. Uh, and so the matter continues until today. I've written about it elsewhere, but there's no time to talk about it. Uh, and in fact, it continues in pretty much the same way in just about every functioning sector of the productive economy. And certainly that's one reason why the Pentagon budget remains uh, higher in real dollars today than it was under Nixon, uh, while the government is and the information system is uh, desperately looking for new pretexts the old one having vanished, uh, for new pretexts to maintain this extraordinary uh, public technique for subsidizing the wealthy and the privileged. Uh, that's what it means to get government off our back. You look at the contract with America of Newt Gingrich, uh, you discover that a major component is to increase, to restore our national security and our national defense. Uh, well, that's an interesting phrase. You might ask, who's threatening us exactly? As I read history, the last time the U.S. was threatened was in the War of 1812, uh, and it now produces, uh, U.S. military expenditures are now great or already greater than the rest of the world combined, including government subsidized military sales, which maintain the private economy. Uh, but we have to increase our security. That is, we have to increase the welfare state for the rich, meanwhile cutting down welfare for the poor. Uh, this is then spelled out further, but that's the contract with America by those who uh, preach free market conservatism. Well, needless to say, focusing on rich countries like ours is very misleading. This uh, double-edged uh, advocacy of free markets has by far its most lethal effects in the traditional colonial domains, the third world, which with the single exception of the Japan-based area, which was never properly colonized by the West. Apart from that, uh, it's an utter disaster. Uh, apart from ideologically crafted economic measures that put aside the effects on people when they measure economic health. And with hopelessly uh, inadequate apologies to the victims, I'm going to put aside this terrible story of major crimes against humanity for which we bear major primary and continuing responsibility. Well, the contemporary attack on democracy focuses on its central point, namely accountability. Uh, the huge transnational corporations that increasingly dominate the global economy, they operate, of course, in virtual secrecy. Uh, and the same is true of what the London Financial Times calls the de facto world government that's ta taking shape around them, uh, meaning referring to the World Bank and the IMF and the New World Trade Organization and the executive meetings of, of the rich seven countries, G7, and so on. Uh, all of those can function in technocratic isolation, free from interference by the declining parliamentary institutions, untroubled by the general public, who have only the vaguest idea of what they're doing. Uh, their machinations are, can be known only to a few specialists, and in fact, they're in principle secret. Well, meanwhile, there's a growing sector, kind of a growing surplus population, who don't contribute much to profit, if anything, and therefore don't have any human rights. 
under standard values, the values that we're trying to extend over the world. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a problem. They naturally have to be kept in ignorance, like everyone else, uh, but in addition, they have to be controlled. And the question is how you do that. Well, that problem was faced rather directly in the third world domains that have long been subject to Western control and therefore reveal most clearly the actual guiding ideals of the leaders, uh, at least if you apply rational standards. Uh, there, the favored devices include large-scale terror, uh, death squads, uh, torture, and other similar methods of proven effectiveness. A uh, dramatic example is the terrorist war against Central America during the 1980s against democracy and independence, uh, largely against the church, in fact, uh, proceeding right now. Incidentally, Colombia is the leading example. Uh, within the United States, however, the methods of choice are somewhat different. The primary method, method of, so like we don't send out death squads to kill the superfluous people. We do it in other more indirect ways. Uh, the primary way has been just to keep the superfluous population locked up in urban slums that increasingly resemble concentration camps. Or if that fails, uh, lock them up in prisons. Uh, those are the counterpart in a richer society to the death squads that we train and support uh, in our domains. In June 1994, the Justice Department reported that the number of state and federal prison inmates in the United States had almost tripled since 1980, reaching record heights. Uh, under Reaganite conservatism, the U.S. left its main competitors, Russia and South Africa, well behind in locking up its population, although you'll be happy to learn that Russia has just caught up thanks to the free market reforms. Uh, actually, the highest rate of imprisonment is under the leading U.S. client regime. Uh, Human Rights Watch has just pointed out in a study of torture in the Israeli-occupied territories. Uh, the largely fraudulent drug war uh, has been very effectively used, and indeed is crafted, to imprison the unwanted population in the United States, and the new bipartisan crime bill should facilitate the process with its vast new expenditures for prisons, uh, its sharp increase in the death penalty, and much harsher sentencing procedures. Uh, also, it's worth bearing in mind that the crime bill gives a lift to the economy. It's a Keynesian technique of economic stimulus, a lot of big impulse to the construction industry and so on, and a lot of jobs for just controlling people. It's one of the fastest growing white collar professions in the United States is security uh, personnel, including prison guards. Uh, the great increase in prisons also creates a very cheap, in fact, zero pay, virtually zero pay, and highly disciplined labor force for private corporations and uh, state industry. Uh, so it's pretty useful for the economy. And you can see then why uh, Newt Gingrich's Contract for America calls for a very rapid expansion in this highly efficient uh, device of increasing state power and ridding ourselves of uh, people who have no rights uh, by the simple standard that uh, they don't contribute to profit making. Uh, it's worth paying close attention to this. One of the leading American criminologists, William Chambliss at George Washington University, uh, he discusses what he calls the politics of law and law enforcement, and the politics of it are very interesting, as he shows. Uh, he points out, as have plenty of others, that crime hasn't really changed very much in the last 20 years in scale or even in character, but the perceptions have changed a lot. And furthermore, the punishment has gone up very fast and in highly restricted and specialized ways, targeting the most vulnerable sectors of the population, mainly blacks. Uh, over half the prisoners in federal prisons, about 30 percent in state prisons, are there for drug violations. Uh, Two-thirds of the arrests in 1992, last year for which there are good statistics, were for possession, not for sale and manufacture. So take a look at your favorite federal lockup, and you won't find many executives of chemical corporations that provide the uh, materials or banks that launder the money, rather for possession, like kids on the street. Uh, blacks account for two-thirds of the prisoners convicted for drug offenses, even though studies have shown that more whites than blacks use illegal drugs, and of course about 80 percent of the population is white. And furthermore, the laws themselves are very carefully crafted. 
So it happens for various reasons that in the, in the urban ghettos, crack cocaine is the favored drug, whereas in the white suburbs, it's powdered cocaine. Have a look at the laws for those two, and you'll find that the punishments are radically different. Uh, in fact, black males are considered a criminal population by law enforcement officials, so Chambliss includes from quite interesting studies that are available. Now, this includes direct observation uh, in a project with the Washington police in which you know, law students and so on travel around with the police and just take transcripts of what's happening. He says they're treated as a criminal population. I don't think that's exactly correct. Criminals are supposed to have constitutional rights, but as his and other studies show, uh, that's not true for the black population, which is treated more like a population under military occupation. It's not a, not a criminal population. Uh, actually, the drug war goes down to fine detail. Uh, when you look closely, there's this, there in Colombia, uh, where the situation is monstrous, there nevertheless are human rights groups functioning. The most active is a Jesuit-based uh, peace and justice group. They just came out with a report uh, on atrocities in the last year, a horrendous report. Uh, but they also include an appendix on the drug cartels, which is kind of intriguing. Uh, Colombia is the main source of, you know, illegal drugs here, high technology illegal drugs. Uh, and there are two major cartels. There's the Medellin cartel and the Cali cartel. Uh, and they've been treated quite differently, they point out. Uh, the Medellin cartel has been destroyed, essentially. The Cali cartel is flourishing. And the, the authors go into the reasons. Uh, the Medellin cartel was lower class in, or lower class in origins. And it had something of the character of mafia-style populism. That is, the guys who came up to the top, uh, Pablo Escobar, for example, I mean, undoubtedly big gangsters, but they also would, like, build soccer fields and for the poor, and if your kid was starving, you know, dying of a disease, you could go and they'd give you drugs and so on. This is a familiar sort of semi-feudal pattern that you find. Uh, the, uh, and besides, they were lower class in origin, so they were wiped out. The Kali cartel are just big bankers and industrialists, so nobody's going to touch them. Uh, in fact, they're flourishing, killing people as much as they like, doing anything they want, but they're the right kind of drug peddlers, the kind we like. Uh, so as I say, when you look closely at the drug war, you find that in the finest detail it conforms to the worst predictions that one might make by following Adam Smith's advice and asking what the principal architects of policy are likely to design for their own interest. Uh, Chambliss also points out that perception of crime as important did not precede and motivate government crime laws, as has been claimed by James Q. Wilson and other right-wing scholars. Rather, as polls show, which he reviews, uh, the perception of the issue became, became an issue after it was stimulated by Nixon uh, right-wing Democrats and others who share their goals and perspectives. Uh, the reasons why blacks are targeted are obvious. Uh, they are, uh, they just don't have any clout and they can't defend themselves are the obvious target. And furthermore, engendering fear uh, is a standard method of population control, uh, whether the uh, uh, designated uh, victims are blacks or Jews or homosexuals or whatever. And these, it seems, are the primary reasons for the growth of what Chambliss calls the crime control industry. It's not that crime isn't a real threat to safety and survival, it certainly is and has been for a long time, but the causes aren't being addressed. Uh, rather, it's being used as a method of population control in various ways, uh, and uh, those techniques will increase under the contract with America. Uh, well, in general, it's more vulnerable sectors that are under attack. Uh, blacks are one, another is children, general, in general. They're very easy targets. Uh, that matter has, in fact, been addressed in several recent important studies. One of the best is a UNICEF study uh, carried out by a well-known U.S. economist, Sylvia Ann Hewlett. It's called Child Neglect in Rich Societies. UNICEF usually deals with poor countries, but this one deals with rich countries. And it makes quite interesting reading. Uh, Hewlett studies the last 15 years, and she finds a very sharp split between two different approaches to children, which she calls an Anglo-American model and a continental Europe-Japan model. Uh, others have found the same split. The Anglo-American model, uh, Hewlett 
points out, is, in her words, a disaster for children and families. Uh, the European model, in contrast, has improved their situation considerably, though the economic problems faced are more or less the same. Uh, Hew uh, Hewlett, like other writers, attributes the what she calls a disaster for Anglo American of the Anglo American model for children. She attributes that uh, to the ideological preference for free markets. Uh, that's only half true, as I've mentioned. Uh, whatever one wants to call the reigning ideology, uh, it's unfair to tarnish the good name of conservatism by applying it to this form of violent, lawless, uh, reactionary statism, uh, which has nothing much to do with markets except for the poor. Well, causes aside, there isn't much doubt about the effects of the free market for the more vulnerable, what Hewlett calls the anti-child spirit that has loosened these lands, speaking primarily of the United States and Britain. Uh, this neglect-filled Anglo-American model, as she writes, has largely privatized child rearing while making it effectively impossible for most of the population. And the result is predictable, a disaster for children and families. In contrast, in the much more supportive European model, social policy has strengthened support systems for families and children, and it shows, as she demonstrates. And it's no secret. There's a blue ribbon commission of the state boards of education and the American Medical Association, which pointed out recently that never before has one generation of children been less healthy, less cared for, or less prepared for life than their parents were at the same age. Though remember, that's only true in the neglect-filled Anglo-American societies where an anti-child, anti-family spirit has reigned for 15 years under the guise of conservatism, and family values. Now that's a remarkable triumph of propaganda and a real tribute to the free press and the intellectual community. A symbolic expression of this disaster for children and families is the fate of the, there's an international convention on the rights of the child. Uh, when the UNICEF study came out, it had been ratified by 146 countries, but not the only one that counts, namely the United States. Although, for fairness, we should add that Reaganite conservatism is quite Catholic in its anti-child spirit. So the World Health Organization uh, voted to condemn the Nestle Corporation for aggressive marketing of infant formula, uh, which kills many children in the third world. Uh, the vote was 118 to 1. Uh, well, all that's minor, I should add, as compared with what the World Health Organization calls the silent genocide. They're referring to the 11, estimated 11 million children who die every year as the result of free market policies for the poor and the refusal of the rich to give what amounts to pennies of aid. Another symbolic expression of the disaster is a new line of greeting cards from the Hallmark Corporation. Uh, one of them says, have a super day at school. And it's supposed to be placed under the cereal box in the morning. Uh, the other say, another says, I wish I were there to tuck you in. That's supposed to stick out under the pillow at night. Uh, the point is that parents just aren't home. Uh, that's one effect of the anti-child, anti-family spirit that's engendered by conservatism with its respect for family values. Now, in part, this disaster for children and families is simply the result of falling wages. Uh, state corporate policy has, in fact, been designed to increase inequality radically, and it's succeeded in that. People have to work much longer hours to survive. For much of the population, as the UNICEF report shows, uh, parents have to work 50 or 60 hour work weeks, two parents, merely to provide necessities. And the elimination of such market rigidities as contracts and job security means that you work extra hours at lower wages or else. Uh, that's a flexible labor market. And under those conditions, it doesn't take a great genius to predict the consequences, and the statistics show it, uh, still going through the UNICEF study. Uh, contact time between parents and children has, is down about 40 percent, and high quality contact time when they're really interacting has virtually disappeared for many families. Uh, that leads to destruction of family identity and values, leads to sharply increased reliance on television for child uh, supervision, or called latchkey children, 
with rising child alcoholism and drug use, uh, criminality, violence by and against children, and other obvious effects on health and education, and it, indeed ability to participate in a democratic society, for that matter, even survival. Uh, I repeat, these are not laws of nature, but they are consciously designed social policies with a particular goal, which is being achieved, enrich the Fortune 500 uh, through powerful welfare state for the rich while conducting a, what amounts to a war against families and children and other vulnerable sectors. Actually, some of the consequences of this receive a huge amount of attention and in a very enlightening fashion. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, as I'm sure you've read, major journals have had not been lavishing attention on several new books that are concerned with falling IQ and scholastic achievement. The uh, New York Times, for example, devoted an unusually long lead article in the book review to this topic by Malcolm Brown. Uh, he opens by warning that governments and societies that ignore the issues raised by the books he reviews will do so at their peril. Well, there's no mention of the UNICEF study or, in fact, any others. I've never seen a review elsewhere either uh, and, or any other study that deals with uh, uh, the war against children and families in the Anglo-American societies, uh, which could maybe have something to do with falling scholastic achievement in IQ, but that's uh, we're not supposed to talk about. So what question is it that we're, we ignore at our peril? Well, it turns out to be quite narrow, none of these questions. Uh, it turns out that IQ may be partially inherited and more ominously linked to race uh, with blacks breeding like rabbits and fouling the gene pool. Now, there's a real problem. Uh, one of the problems, the, one of the books that Brown respectfully reviews uh, suggests that maybe black mothers don't nurture their children because, I'm quoting, they e evolved in the warm but highly unpredictable environment af of Africa. Now, that's real hard science, you know, which we ignore at our peril. Uh, on the other hand, we may, and indeed we must, ignore the social policies based on free markets for the poor and state protection for the rich. So we must, and Brown does, uh, as does everyone else, ignore the fact that in the city where the articles appear, richest city in the world, 40% uh, of the children live below the poverty line, meaning deprived of any hope of escape from misery and destitution. Poverty level in the United States is twice that of any other industrial country. Next in the game is Thatcher, who hasn't quite, Thatcherite England, which hasn't quite reached us, and then you get to the European Japanese model. Uh, well, could that have something to do with the falling measures of IQ and achievement or the other consequences of the war against children and families uh, that's discussed in the unmentionable studies? Well, such questions we don't have to answer. We can readily ignore them. And that's a very natural decision by the rich and the powerful addressing one another and looking for justifications for the class war that they're conducting uh, and its horrifying human effects. Well, these are examples of some of the uglier forms of population control. There are also more benign variants, which deserve some mention. And the benign variant, the rabble are supposed to be diverted into harmless pursuits by the huge propaganda institutions that are organized and run by the business community. Uh, they uh, spend hundreds of billions of dollars a year, incidentally half of it is in the United States, uh, with the goal of converting people into atoms of consumption and obedient tools of production, at least when they're lucky enough to get work, uh, crucially isolated from one another and lacking even a conception of what a decent human life might be. And that's important. Uh, normal human sentiments have to be crushed, they have to be beaten out of people's heads. Uh, they are inconsistent with an ideology that's geared to the needs of privilege and power an ideology that celebrates private profit as the supreme human value and denies people rights uh, beyond what they can salvage in the labor market. I should say that this has been going on for a century and a half and is an interesting story in itself. And again, I stress, uh, not everybody is supposed to live under market discipline, only poor people. The rich are to be protected by an ever more powerful state and by the global oligopoly that ensures that policy will be insulated from politics. Uh, these contemporary advertising onslaughts kill more than the mind and the spirit. They also kill people, and on a pretty impressive scale. 
Uh, one major exercise of state power under Reagan-Bush conservatism was their updating of Britain's opium wars of 150 years ago uh, when the British forced China to accept Britain's exports of lethal narcotics from its uh, Indian colony. And the current revival uh, uh, relies on the threats of trade sanctions against countries that are unwilling to permit free import and free advertising for today's leading uh, lethal narcotic, leading killer, namely tobacco, uh, which just uh, orders a magnitude beyond illegal drugs and its lethal effects and the deaths from it and so on. Uh, the advertising of the U.S. and British giants targets primarily the most promising new markets, namely young people and women. Uh, much of East and Southeast Asia has already succumbed to U.S. threats. These are backed by GATT under the name of free trade. Uh, the U.S. Agriculture Department, also trumpeting free trade, uh, gives grants to tobacco firms to promote smoking overseas in an effort to stimulate the profitable slaughter. Uh, Asian countries have attempted anti-smoking campaigns, but they're overwhelmed by the miracles of the market, reinforced by U.S. state power through the sanctions threat. There's a uh, epidemiologist in Oxford University who's really studied this, and he recently studied this. He estimates that among Chinese children under 20 today, 50 million will die of cigarette-related diseases. It's an achievement that ranks reasonably high even by 20th century standards. Uh, well, along with democracy and rights, markets are also under intensive attack. Uh, even if we put aside the massive state intervention at home and in your national economy, increasing under the Reaganites, uh, the increasing economic concentration and market control, uh, they alone offer endless devices to evade and undermine market discipline. That's a long story that there's no time to go into here, but let me just mention with one illustration. Uh, about 40% of what's called world trade isn't really trade at all in any meaningful sense. Uh, rather, it's operations that are internal to corporations, which happen to cross a border, <coughs> like the Ford Motor Company sends something from one assembly plant to another, happens to cross a border in the process. That's called trade. Uh, those interactions are, in fact, centrally managed by a very visible hand uh, with all sorts of mechanisms for undermining markets in the interests of profit and power. Uh, in reality, we have a kind of quasi-mercantilist system of transnational corporate capitalism, which is just rife with the kinds of conspiracies of the masters against the public, of which Adam Smith warned, uh, not to speak of the traditional reliance on state power and public subsidy. There's a 1992 study of the OECD, you know, the rich countries, uh, which concludes, sorry for the jargon, but I'll translate it into English afterwards, oligopolistic competition and strategic interaction among firms and governments rather than the invisible hand of market forces condition today's competitive advantage and international division of labor in high technology industries as indeed in agriculture and pharmaceuticals and services and major areas of economic activity in general. In other words, what really makes things efficient is oligopoly, you know, big corporations working together in quasi-conspiracies and interactions with the state power that defends and protects them. That's what really works in today's economy, uh, according to the organization of the rich countries of the world. Well, the vast majority of the world's population who are subjected to market discipline and regaled with odes to its wonders are not supposed to hear these words, and in fact, they rarely do. Again, some free advice to those of you who want to make it in the ideological institutions you're not supposed to hear those words or to understand them or certainly to transmit them to the general population. That would be a bad mistake. You're supposed to talk about the miracles of the market. Uh, these tendencies are enhanced by the free trade agreements. That's just another Orwellian term. Uh, in reality, these pacts are designed to enhance investor rights, not free trade. Uh, you look at them closely. There's a combination of liberalization and protectionism which is very carefully geared to the interests of the transnational corporations uh, that are supposed to monopolize the technology of the future, the knowledge of the future through highly protectionist devices, and of course to rule the world economy. 
it's very clear when you look at them closely. These agreements, including NAFTA and GATT, are neither free nor are they specifically about trade, and they are certainly not agreements, if by that term we include the general public, which by and large has opposed them in most of the countries. However, politics is insulated from policy, so it doesn't, uh, policy is insulated from politics, so it doesn't matter. Uh, these uh, agreements, uh, these investor rights agreements, are likely to achieve, the, at least enhance, the basic goal, namely to accelerate uh, the drift of global society, including the rich countries, to a kind of third world model, uh, a model where you have islands of enormous wealth and privilege and a growing sea of misery and despair. Well, to uh, reverse this course, or at least to stem it, and to restore a bit of respect for the values of classical liberalism as it really was and values of the Enlightenment that have long been forgotten, uh, for respect for freedom and human rights. Uh, to, to do that, it's not necessary to repeal the principles of gravitation. It's only necessary to penetrate the clouds of deceit and distortion, to learn the truth about the world, and to act to change it. That's never been impossible. It's never been easy. It's not impossible today, and it's not going to be easy today. Uh, there's rarely, if ever, been a time in human history when that choice carried such enormous human consequences. Uh, there's a mic there if anybody wants to uh, put their two or five or 20 cents in. Can you hear? No, can you hear? I, I can, but I don't know if anybody else can. Is this better? Can you hear? Yeah, OK, it's okay. working. Um, Thanks for mentioning that demonstration on November 10th, by the way. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting to people who are paying attention to what's going on in East Timor, for me in particular, as someone who's involved in the East Timor Solidarity Movement, is how it's become possible in the last four, five, six years to talk about what's going on in Indonesia. And even the Washington Post and the New York Times had an article on Sunday talking about East Timor, specifically demographic shifts in the population and everything mm -hmm. else. Um, what's conspicuously absent is any sort of relevant context that looks at the U.S. role yeah. in supporting this genocide and everything else. It's usually talked about in the context of, you know, Indonesian annexation or whatever, ignoring both the role of the media and the role of the U.S. But the discussion exists, which seems to be something of an advancement, but removed from context seems to kind of defeat the purpose of discussion at all. I was wondering if you might comment on the significance that this discussion is taking place mm -hmm. for those who have tried to open the discussion of East Timor yeah. and your responsibility, In fact, it's, right. and what the implications are that the discussion is so removed from its proper right. context. Yeah, actually, it's an extremely revealing case. You want to learn something about our own society and culture and values and so on. This is a very interesting case. It's not a minor one. It's probably the biggest slaughter relative to the population since the Holocaust, which makes it not small. Uh, it was mo the worst part of it was in the late 70s under the Carter administration. Uh, it's still going on. I just gave the example of one big massacre where maybe five or 600 people were killed, which we happen to know about for the act because of the accidents I mentioned, but it's still going on. Uh, it, at the time, in the late 70s, it was at about the scale of the Pol Pot massacres and relative to the population, much larger. Uh, furthermore, it was radically different from the Pol Pot massacres in one critical respect. The, nobody had any idea about how to stop the Pol Pot massacres, but it was trivial to stop this one. Uh, we could simply follow a stand for one of the principles of the Hippocratic Oath, uh, which begins by saying, first, do no harm. Then we'll talk about other things. In fact, that massacre was going on because the United States was crucially supporting it. The Carter, the U.S. was providing, it took, the invasion took place with the explicit authorization of Henry Kissinger and Gerald Ford, uh, who, uh, Kissinger at, at once, secretly, although it leaked, uh, moved to increase the sales of U.S. arms, uh, including counterinsurgency equipment to Indonesia, which already was 90 percent armed with U.S. arms. It's now known from leaked documents that the British and Americans and Australians knew all about it and advanced and followed it. It was continuing. Uh, the, as the, before the invasion, coverage of East Timor was, in fact, rather high. 
surprisingly high. The reason was this was part of the Portuguese empire, and there was a lot of concern at the time that with the Portuguese empire collapsing, you know, countries might do what's called moving towards communism, meaning moving toward independence, which is not allowed. So there was, in that context, a lot of coverage of East Timor. Uh, as the invasion took place, the coverage started to decline, and it declined very sharply. Uh, by 1978, when the atrocities reached their peak, coverage reached zero, literally zero in the United States and Canada, another big supporter. Uh, in 1978, the Carter administration, in fact, rushed new supplies of arms to Indonesia because they were actually running out of arms in the slaughter, which maybe by then had killed a couple hundred thousand people. Where there had been any coverage of all, at all, it was simply repetition of grotesque lies by the State Department or Indonesian generals presented as news in the front page. Well, around the early 80s, the change began that you described. There began to be some coverage, although always excluding the American role, which was crucial. For example, uh, not only in providing arms, and, but even diplomatic support. And furthermore, it's not a secret. Like you read the memoirs of our UN ambassador, uh, Senator Daniel Moynihan, who's greatly praised for his uh, defense of international law. He describes it in his memoirs. He was UN ambassador when the Indonesian invasion took place. And he says something like this, is close to exact. He says, the State Department wanted things to turn out as they did. Uh, and I was given the responsibility of rendering the United Nations utterly ineffective uh, in any action it might take. Uh, I carried out this responsibility with great success. And then he goes on to describe the effects, which he was not unaware of. He says, in the first couple of months, it seems that about 60,000 people were killed, approximately the percentage of the population that the Russians, that the Germans, the Nazis killed in Eastern Europe during World War II. That's, what, that's Moynihan, the great advocate of international law. And he's right. That's what happened. Uh, the State Department wanted things to turn out as he did, and the U.S. ensured that it did. The Carter administration then came along and increase the flow of arms. The press did its job by shutting up down to zero at the peak point. Well, there were a small, it was, there was a very small number of people who were, follow, who were working on this. Literally, you know, it, there probably weren't more than a dozen. I mean, it was a tiny group of activists working on it. Finally, they succeeded in getting somewhere. Uh, there began to be some press coverage. Uh, some, conserv some congressmen, incidentally, mostly conservative congressmen like Tony Hall, got interested, uh, pressure began to develop. Uh, the coverage was exactly as you say. It completely wipes out the record. The most, that it, the sharpest criticism that you'll find is uh, the United States didn't try hard enough to get uh, Indonesia to stop its atrocities, or we didn't pay enough attention to it, which is kind of like saying that, you know, the Russians didn't try hard enough to bring freedom to Eastern Europe. You know, I didn't pay att enough attention to it. That was their problem. That's not fair to the Russians if you consider the comparison of what happened. Uh, the, uh, by the late 80s, it was becoming real in the United States, thanks to a s small and indeed growing number of activists. Uh, about a year or two ago, it got to the point that Congress actually passed a legislation uh, banning U.S. military training for Indonesian officers because of these human rights violations, which I was putting it pretty mildly, uh, that was kind of embarrassing for the Clinton administration, but they got out of it all right. They uh, announced that the law didn't mean what it said. Uh, rather, what the law meant was that uh, the United States couldn't train Indonesian military officers with money from the United States itself. But if the Indonesians paid for it, let's say with money we gave them from some other pocket, then it was okay. Well, Congress protested, but it went through. The State Department, with rare delicacy, picked the anniversary of the invasion to announce this. Uh, but things are proceeding. Uh, just to give you an example, in Boston, uh, on the first anniversary, of the, something happened this week which is relevant and shows you can really do things. Uh, there was a court case in Boston this week uh, where, they, uh, where an Indonesian general was brought under a civil suit by the mother of one of the kids, boys, who was killed in uh, the Dili massacre. Her name is Helen Todd, which explains why the civil suit went through. You can figure that part out. Uh, she uh, uh, 
uh, this suit, uh, what happened is that when Indonesia was carrying out this cover-up, probably run by some <coughs> big public relations firm in the United States after the Dili massacre, one of the things they did was get the generals out of the way so nobody would see them. And one of them was sent off to Harvard to study. Well, some local people in Boston f found it out and went to Har they checked with Harvard. Harvard claimed they'd never heard of him, you know. Uh, but he was there. He was studying. And uh, they started protests began to build up. And then came my favorite Boston Globe headline in history. Uh, on the first anniversary of the Dili massacre, it said, uh, Indonesian general facing suit flees Boston. Uh, and indeed, that's what happened. He fled Boston and hasn't been seen since. Uh, meanwhile, here, the, uh, uh, meanwhile, the suit went on. There is a law which says that you can bring civil suits against torturers and murderers and so on if they happen to be on U.S. soil. Uh, and uh, he uh, didn't show up. So the, the, just this week, the judge heard the testimony of Helen Todd and Alan Aaron and others and was impressed. And uh, he now has a $14 million fine in case a civil suit in case he ever shows up. Uh, incidentally, the same thing happened a year before with one of Guatemala's leading killers, General Gramajo, who the State Department was grooming to be the next president. And he was shipped off to Harvard also to refine his skills. And that was discovered. He was one of the big mass murderers from the early 80s. Uh, he, uh, uh, actually, I found out about that one from the Central American press. People approached Harvard, never heard of him, you know. Uh, but Alan Nairn, who's a very enterprising journalist and imaginative, uh, he waited until the Harvard graduation commencement ceremonies, which are televised. And as General Gramajo was coming up to receive his degree, he raced up in front of the television cameras and served him with a subpoena on television. <laughs> and that one, he fled Boston, too. <laughs> and that came to court, and he was fined $10 million. Uh, well, you know, these things are just show you can do things. I mean, there's enough change so that Indo Indonesia is very worried about it, very worried. Uh, they, and things are getting to the point where they might actually allow a referendum or something. There's a possibility, but it's going to take a lot more pressure. Among the other things that are not reported, incidentally, uh, are the fact that uh, I have yet to see a word about this in the United States. One of the main reasons for the invasion of East Timor, which was well known at the time, is now completely public, uh, is that there's a big oil field off Timor. And the Australians and the Western companies had been trying to make a deal with Portugal to exploit that oil, and they hadn't been doing too well. And they figured that an independent East Timor would be really hard to deal with. But Indonesia would be easy, because that's one of their boys. They've been running it for ever since a big massacre that the West applauded in 1965. Uh, so in fact, the Australian records, leaked diplomatic records, show that they said before the invasion, we'll do better with an Indonesian takeover. All right, that's been proceeding. There's a treaty uh, um, signed between Australia and Indonesia to exploit Timorese oil. Uh, right after the Dili massacre, the West reacted uh, by, uh, f apart from sending additional arms to Indonesia, uh, by uh, 15 Western oil companies starting exploration in the Timor oil fields. Uh, now there are apparently some promising strikes. Some were announced just a few weeks ago. Uh, there's also a world court case. Portugal's challenging it in the world court. If you've seen a word about this, you've read something I haven't read. Uh, this is the ma one of the major stories about Timor. So that one's still under wraps. But the point is, you know, that things can be done. And this is a particularly dramatic case because there were really a handful of people doing it. Uh, and, you know, they're getting somewhere, maybe getting far enough so the policy could even change, particularly if there were parallel efforts in other countries. Like Britain's perfectly happy to take up the slack and make as much money as they can by selling arms to Indonesia if the United States backs off. So it's got to be a coordinated effort. Hi, um, I just wanted to get you to um, make a few comments about two things. One, um, about how um, outside the framework of the um, like industrial um, monopolies in the United States, how Cuba has been able to survive this long and how that um, can be an example for change and how people can live a different way and also how we can help um, Cuba and prevent um, the United States from destroying what they've created. Well, by the most amazing accident, I happen to have another leaflet in front of me <laughs> uh, which answers that question. 
uh, it says that there's going to be a national march on Washington on Saturday, November 12th, uh, which is called by the end of the end the U.S. blockade of Cuba coalition, and it calls upon Clinton to stop using hunger as a weapon uh, to threaten uh, the Cuban people and to start uh, talks to normalize relations. Incidentally, those of you who choose to go on that march, and I hope plenty will, will be joining with the entire world, uh, with the exception of two countries, namely the United States and Israel, uh, which alone voted against the, uh, the condemnation of this uh, embargo at the United Nations a few days ago. The New York Times has yet to discover that fact. Uh, there was a vote the preceding year in which the U.S. was able to get three votes uh, Israel, United States, Israel, and Romania, but apparently Israel, Romania dropped off this year. Uh, so you're not exactly in isolation if you oppose it. In fact, what the embargo and uh, the uh, effort to strangle the decision, the form, again, documents are available now, the decision to over, the formal decision to overthrow the government of Cuba was taken by the Eisenhower administration in March 1960. That date is quite important. It had nothing to do with the Cold War. Uh, Castro at that time was anti-communist. There were no <laughs> Russians around. Uh, now, the historians have a different story, like uh, the court historian of the Kennedy administration, Arthur Schlesinger, had an article in the Wall Street Journal recently in which he opposed the embargo, but he said, well, you know, it's a relic of the Cold War. Uh, the effort to overthrow the Castro government beca came because it was uh, regarded as an outpost of Russian power and it was fomenting revolution in Latin America, but now those days are over. Well, you know, he knows that that's complete fabrication. Uh, the decision, the formal decision to overthrow the government was long before it had anything to do with Russians and there were no fomenting revolution anywhere. It was just going on an independent path. And remember, this is a country that the United States has considered that it owns ever since the 1820s. Uh, one of the earliest parts of American history was, you know, foreign relations was the decision by Jefferson and John Quincy Adams and others that this was the f country that we had to take Cuba. Uh, the British Army d Navy was in the way at that time and they were a deterrent. So the decision in Adams' words was to wait until it falls into our hands like a ripe fruit by the laws of political gravitation. It finally did and the U.S. ran it with the usual effects up until 1959. Almost immediately, attacks on Cuba began, bombing of Cuba from Florida and so on. Uh, then came the decision to overthrow the government. Then Kennedy, who radically escalated the terror against Cuba, uh, and in fact, you know, to levels previously unheard of. There's nothing comparable in the history of international terrorism. And in addition, came along the embargo, uh, which was you know, this is a little country in the U.S. sphere of influence. I'm not going to survive very long against a monster. Uh, it was able to survive thanks to Soviet support, uh, but barely. Although it did, you know, you can, many things were achieved. Uh, it was also pretty tyrannical, so it's, it was an up and a downside. But uh, it, was, it was succeeding in terms which were meaningful to other people, which is what the United States was concerned about. The real crime of Cuba was not the repression, which, whatever you think about it, doesn't come close to the kind of repression we supported and, in fact, uh, implemented in nearby countries, not even close. Uh, the real crime was the, was the successes and the threat of a demonstration effect. That is, others might try to do the same thing. That's what's known as a rotten apple that might inf uh, uh, spoil the barrel or a virus that might infect the region or something. Uh, well. Uh, in 1991, I guess, the next step came along. Oh, incidentally, when, when the R Berlin Wall fell in 1989, the Russians are out of the game, uh, we not, had an interesting event take place. Nobody noticed. I mean, for 30 years, the story had been, we have to defend ourselves against Cuba because there's an outpost of the Russians. Okay, all of a sudden, the Russians aren't there. So what happens? Well, we have to harshen. We have to make the attack against Cuba harsher. And it's in interesting that the propaganda system <coughs> didn't skip a beat. You know, check back and try to find if somebody noticed this. All of a sudden, it turned out that we were really, we really had them under an embargo because we're of our love for democracy and human rights, as is illustrated, for example, by Colombia or you know any other thousand other cases. Uh, so that's why we're we're trying to torture them. Uh, the Democrats got into the act at that point. A liberal Democrat, Robert Torricelli, who's head of the 
uh, House Latin American Affairs Committee, and he pushed through something called the Democracy Enhancement Act, uh, Cuban Democracy Act, I guess it's called, which makes the embargo tighter. Now, this proposal was so obviously in conflict with international law that Bush actually vetoed it. But then he was outflanked from the right during the 1992 campaign by the Democrats, and he then accepted it. It was immediately denounced by all, U I think every U major U.S. ally went through the U.N. the way I described. But, you know, the U.S. makes its own laws. We don't care what happens. Uh, the, uh, as the ambassador of the U.N. said the other day in the debate, uh, if possible, we will act multilaterally. If necessary, we will act unilaterally, uh, violently. She was referring to Madeleine Albright. That's the way it is when you're the chief mafia don. If others, will, if you can get support from others, okay. Otherwise, you do it yourself because you don't follow any rules. That's us. Uh, in this case, the the enhanced embargo has been quite effective. Uh, about 90 percent of the aid and trade that it cut off was food and medicine. And that's had its effects. There are two major articles in leading U.S. medical journals uh, last month, October, which describe the effects. Uh, the health system, which was extremely good, uh, is collapsing. Uh, there's a tremendous shortage of medicines. Uh, there's a shortage of malnutrition is increasing. Uh, rare diseases that hadn't been seen since Japanese prison camps in the Second World War are reappearing. Uh, infant mortality is going up. Uh, general health conditions are going down. In other words, working pretty fine. We're enhancing democracy. Uh, and uh, maybe we can ultimately make them as well off as, say, uh, you know, Honduras or one of the countries that we've been taking care of for all of these years. Uh, well, that's what it's all about. Uh, meanwhile, the commissar class has to give their version of it. You know, we were defending ourselves against the Russians, and then all of a sudden we discovered we love democracy. But anyway, we've got to keep crushing them. Uh, it's... Uh, uh, right now, the United States is so isolated in the world that it may not be able to get away with it, no matter how powerful we are. In fact, even the U.S. business community is beginning to have second thoughts, uh, being concerned that they might be cut out of potentially lucrative business operations if others just stop obeying the laws imposed by the enforcer. Uh, that's another one that can be pressed, should be pressed. The blockade is, this blockade is, I mean, sanctions in general are pretty, you know, very questionable operation, but this one, particularly when they're not supported by the population targeted, uh, this one is particularly brutal uh, and, uh, you know, a real major crime, in my opinion. Anyway, things can be done like this March on Washington. My name is Robert Hastings, and I live in Columbia, Maryland. And I'd like to get your comments on the irony of the fact that this, a version of the talk you're giving tonight is going to be broadcast on 100 stations, community radio stations in the United States, the entire nation of Canada by the organization that I represent, and um, that it's not going to be heard here in Baltimore, that this stuff is not picked up at all in Baltimore, and there's no community radio involvement in this town. Mm -hmm. and, um, somebody did tell me that C-SPAN is doing it. True. Know if that's correct. But, and then, of course, there's Radio Free Maine, don't forget. And, right. <laughs> But there's no radio free Baltimore. Yeah. And to that end, yeah. to that end, I'd like to invite everyone in the audience to join me in forming a community radio station in Baltimore, and I'll be taking sign-ups after this event. Um, additionally, I'd like any thoughts or speculations that you have why that in one of the richest areas in the United States in terms of frequency, in terms of populace, that there's no community radio station where the East Timor issue is discussed in earnest, where people with green hair might get some time on the air, and et cetera. Do you have any speculations on why that may, might be true here? Yeah, I think so. It's uh, not hard, in fact. Just ask yourself how, it, if you were one of the principal architects of policy and you had the levers of power and wealth in your hands, what would you care more about? A community radio station, say, in Boston, or a community radio station in, say, Boulder, Colorado. Well, uh, there is one in Boulder, Colorado. There isn't one in Boston. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, the farther you get away from the centers of power and doctrinal control, the more you find freedom and openness. Not surprising. Uh, like, nobody cares all that much what people think about in, say, you know, central Kentucky. 
but they care a lot what they think in uh, places like Washington and its environs in New York and Boston and so on, because they have decision-making power. Uh, and I think you find that that's incidentally why it's being, you know, you tell me, I take your word for it, this is being broadcast all over Canada, but only in very marginal places here. Uh, but that's, again, those are things that can be overcome. You know, these aren't laws of nature at all. Uh, in fact, you might ask yourself, how come that we're talking about community radio? Why not mainstream radio? Uh, well, you know, the United States diverged from the rest of the world on this issue back around the late 1920s, early 30s, when radio was coming into existence, just coming along. Uh, radio isn't like shoes. There's a fixed band, which is going to be rationed, necessarily. And the question is, how is it going to be done? Well, as far as I know, every country, in the, certainly every major country, maybe every country in the world, except the United States, turned, turned radio into a public a public forum, meaning it's as democratic as the country is. Like in Russia, not democratic. In Britain, as democratic as England is, and so on. But somehow a public in the public domain. The United States went the other way. It was privatized. It was put into private hands. And furthermore, that was called a victory for democracy. And, uh, uh, and this is unique. When television came along, the same thing happened. So now if you want uh, radio, say, that's not under corporate control, you have to go to community radio stations on the mar Im very important, but of course, limited resources on the margins and so on, and they ought to be built up. I think you, I agree with you on that. Yeah. Hi, how you doing? I uh, want to say I'm happy to see you in person. I heard you many times on Pacifica Network yeah. and quite a few times, and uh, just want to ask maybe a couple quick questions, and maybe it could be quick because a few people also are, are waiting. Uh, one specifically is like pertains to the coming like midterm elections for Congress and the positions on various congressmen. And all of you who bother to vote actually, which I know is not many of you, you better listen up because this is probably a most pertinent point regarding who is in Congress and who is voting on this GATT treaty in December. And I was wondering what is your opinion on the matter? Quite a few people nowadays think that the World Trade Organization is the de facto government of the New World Order, and the GATT treaty they're voting on is officially the constitution of the New World Order government. Well, what is your opinion on that matter? I'm wondering. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, I've actually written, it's a complicated issue. I don't think you can say anything simple. The one simple thing is I think there, it should at least be subjected to public discussion. I mean, the idea, this is something of major significance. You know, and the idea of allowing it to be rammed through on a fast track without public discussion is ridiculous and grotesque, in fact. So whatever one thinks about it, at least it should become a topic for the general public to become informed about and to investigate and to look at and to think about carefully. Uh, that's point one. That's the easy part. What should happen in that public discussion? Well, you know, if that public discussion ever comes along, I'll be glad to say what I think. And I, what I think is, in fact, mixed. Mixed. I mean, like NAFTA. It's a sort of a mixed like story. Uh, I don't know of any major, anyone in fact, who was opposed to a North American free trade agreement, a North American trade agreement. The question is, what kind? Yeah. Okay. And in fact, like take, say, NAFTA. Uh, very mainstream groups, like for example, the Congressional Office of Technology Assessment. Can't get more centrist than that. Uh, that's Congress's research organization. They came out with a very sharp and intelligent critique of the executive version of NAFTA, the one that got passed, uh, pointing out that, in fact, it was designed as an investor rights agreement, which was going to drive both the United States, well, the United States, Canada, and Mexico, all three of them, towards a kind of a low-wage, low-growth equilibrium. They didn't say high profit, but also high profit. Uh, and they suggested very constructive alternatives. Well, that never entered the discussion. You know, uh, the, all that you heard was, oh, you know, crazy jingoists, uh, you know, don't like Mexican workers. Uh, and in fact, the same was true of the labor movement. Labor movement uh, was, n its proposals were nothing like what was denounced in the press with virtually 100% uniformity. Uh, the Labor Advisory Committee uh, had very, which is by law required to give its opinion on these things, but was cut out of the discussion illegally, uh, never reported. They uh, did come out with a report which was quite constructive. It wasn't against an agreement, it was against that agreement. 
Now, when you turn to Gad, it's the same story. You know, you take a look at these thousands of pages. I think the thing runs this huge document. Has well, anybody you know, read you the can Gat? find it. Has anybody in the world read yeah. the Gat? That's yeah, a there are people point. in the world who've read it. A There's few. plenty of guys working for big corporations interests. who've read it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, but, and in fact, if you look at it, it's a big, it's a mixture of many things. Uh, let me just mention one. Um, there, first of all, I should say that we're very ignorant about this here. But in the third world, they know a lot about it. Like you go to India, let's say, and you get hundreds of thousands of people demonstrating in the streets about some of the provisions of GATT, which they know about. Maybe we're dumb and stupid, but they're not. You know, like Indian peasants understand what's being done to them, uh, which is why GATT has to be passed virtually at gunpoint in countries like India. Well, what are they upset about? Here's one thing. Uh, one of the parts of GATT, as NAFTA, is what's called intellectual property rights. Uh, intellectual property rights is a protectionist measure. It has nothing to do with, it's the opposite of free trade. It increases, it does two things, uh, I mean a lot of things, but two crucial ones. It increases the duration of patents, meaning if, say, you know, Merck Pharmaceutical patents some drug thanks to publicly subsidized work in the universities, for example, uh, then they, uh, uh, the, they get a long, much longer patent incidentally, much longer patents than any of the rich Western countries ever accepted during the period when they were developing. It's only in very recent years they've even honored patent rights. The United States never did when it was a developing country. So point one, patents are being much extended. Secondly, they're being shifted in character. Uh, traditionally, up till now, patents have been what are called process patents. Like if Merck, going back to that drug, if Merck figures out a way to create a drug, the process is patented, but not, not the product. Uh, the GATT treaty, like NAFTA, shifts that. It's now the product that's patented, uh, meaning in the, the Indian pharmaceutical industry or the Argentine pharmaceutical industry can't figure out a smarter way to produce the same drug at half the cost uh, and then get it to their own population. Notice that this is not only protectionist. Uh, it's a blow against economic efficiency and against technological pro progress. That shows you how much of free trade is involved in this. Uh, actually, there's historical precedents on product patents, and I'm sure they're known to the GATT designers. France, for example, about early in the century, had a chemical industry, but it lost it. Uh, most of the chemi chemical industry shifted to Switzerland, which is why Switzerland has a big chemical industry. The reason was uh, France happened to have product patents, which just you know, were such a uh, barrier to innovation and technical progress that companies just went elsewhere. All right, GATT is trying to impose that inefficiency uh, and uh, opposition to progress and high cost, incidentally, on the whole world. Uh, now, you know, this means India has already been forced to accept it. The, a couple of weeks ago, they what they called liberalized their pharmaceutical industry, meaning they opened it up to foreign penetration, which means that drug prices will shoot sky high, uh, more children will die, so on and so forth. Well, you know, this is one part of GATT. I mean, in my opinion, that's a part that is just absurd. It's, I mean, it's not absurd, it's grotesque. It's part of the technique to ensure that unaccountable transnational corporations monopolize the technology of the future. I don't see any reason to push that through. Uh, certainly anyone who believes in free trade would be opposed to that. Uh, so that's one part. And you can talk at other part, about other parts, you know, but I think you really have to think about it. You know, like it's, uh, it can't, you can't just have a, it's not, you can't just have slogans. You know, but one thing seems to me clear, we ought to be thinking about it, meaning shouldn't be rammed through. The, there are important considerations. There are very public important questions debate, at stake. Yeah. Yeah. Which there is none. No, there isn't. That is a telling point. There it's is a very no telling public point. debate on this GATT question. Yeah, in fact, Even nobody knows people, what's in Who it. knows how your congressman or who you're going to vote for Or what's in voting or what they're issue. voting for. You huh? know, who knows what they're voting for. Yeah, even, that's you, another you know, point. Well, but what that's, but that's part of the hatred of democracy. I mean, NAFTA was supposed to go through on a fast track, too. The only reason it didn't is because there was unexpected popular protest, uh, which... Perhaps. Yeah. Wake up, people. <laughs> There's a lot at stake. I mean, I just mentioned one thing. There's plenty more. You know. Yeah. But that's what I just have got to go. But I, could we... Uh, okay, but could I, could I just ask... I, you, I think... Do you just make a rebuttal to this? I'm, I'm just going to say, I'm sorry, I asked too okay. many questions, but these people kind of slammed We're kind of okay, short on time if we, yeah, if we can, yeah, two, I'm told we can take two more questions, and I 
the innuendo is. I should give short answers. Right. Too polite to say that. Yeah. Good. Uh, you, you had mentioned in your speech that the globalization of capital is basically an attack on democracy and working people. Uh, do you have any ideas about how to organize against the globalization of capital? Yeah. It ha I mean, it's different than it. There's one difference in scale, which is important. Uh, in the past, working people did achieve many gains, but that was within a national framework. And now the struggle has got to be in an international framework, and that's a lot harder. Uh, just to give you an indication of how much harder, let me give an example, you know, of the first try, one of the first tries. Uh, right after the, Na the NAFTA agreement, the Clinton administration was compelled by pu public protest to add to the NAFTA agreement some verbiage about labor rights. And take it very seriously, but the wording is in there. Okay, right after NAFTA was passed, two big U.S. corporations, I think it was GE and Honeywell, uh, fired labor organizers. People were trying to organize unions at plants in northern Mexico. Okay, normally that just happens and it's the end of it. Unions entered, uh, UE and another union, I forget which, entered and uh, protested with the Clinton administration. And they've got some clout, you know, like they're not corporations, but they got a lot more power than Mexican. There aren't, a uh, Mexican union, there's a government union, which is kind of like in Russia. And there's one independent labor union, which is, of course, opposed to NAFTA, but it's under terrific controls. Uh, however, the American unions couldn't be completely ignored. So they called for, you know, the thing to go to a panel to deter, which means the U.S. Labor Department, I think, uh, to determine whether, in fact, there had been an infringement on labor rights when these organizers were fired. And just last week, uh, the Labor Department came out with its decision, which was that it was quite okay uh, because they had legal recourse under Mexican law, uh, and therefore there was no issue. I don't know if, the, if any of you are familiar with Mexican labor law and the way it's implemented. This doesn't even rise to the level of hilarity, you know. Uh, but anyway, that was the decision, so the firing goes through. They're allowed to apply for severance pay and so on. Very happy. Uh, I'm sure GE is mourning. Uh, the, uh, but that's the kind of thing that has to be done, and it's hard. You know, it means, first of all, transnational popular organization and struggling against very powerful enemies like the national states, including those who call themselves liberal, you know, but are really, they have other masters. Uh, so that's by no means going to be anything easy, but it has to be done. Uh, uh, the uh, NAFTA, for example, even its advocates, if, if you look closely, even its advocates conceded that it was probably going to harm in absolute terms, the majority of the population in both Mexico and, and the United States. For example, its advocates here said, well, it's really good. It'll only harm semi-skilled workers. Footnote, 70% of the workforce. You know. The New York Times had a uh, very, af after NAFTA, after NAFTA was safely passed, they did their first analysis of its effects. Very upbeat article talking about how great it was going to be for corporate lawyers and, you know, uh, PR firms and so on and so forth. It's going to be really terrific. And there was a footnote there, too. It said, well, you know, everyone can't gain. And it said there'll be some losers. Uh, women, blacks, Hispanics, and semi-skilled labor, you know, like most of the people of New York, you know. Uh, but you can't have everything. Uh, and those were the advocates. Uh, so yeah, uh, it's, this is, so there, there certainly are common interests across the borders. But they've got to be mobilized. And it's hard enough to do it even in one country. Doing it across borders is going to be extremely hard, but it just has to be done, or else you can just see where the future is going to go. I mean, there are very powerful centralized forces uh, which are got their own agenda. They're not making much of a secret about it. And you can see where it's going to lead. Uh, you take a look at any third world country, you get a picture of where it's going to lead. Uh, and uh, the question is, do we want to live with that? that? You don't have to. These aren't laws of nature but they're not going to be easy to combat. Uh, one short comment and then a question. First about Cuba. Uh, I, I had the pleasure of going to the Kennedy Museum in Boston um, with some former Soviet um, army officers at, who were reduced to tears from laughing at the film about the Cuban Missile Crisis in which the um, country Turkey is never even mentioned mm. um, as a pretext for Kennedy's um, for the missiles, Soviet placing of the missiles in Cuba. I just think that's an interesting part of the ideological war against Cuba. Um, the question I had to ask um, 
this whole, I wouldn't call it a debate, but this whole new effort in the media touting the information superhighway is, is, is reminiscent of the euphoria around television in the mid-60s about the global village, so on and so forth. Um, and I tend to agree with some of the critics of television that, who have argued that television's main effect has been as a medium of social control, dividing people. Uh, some of the themes you've brought up in past talks as well. What are your views about the information superhighway? Is it a force for democracy? Is it a force for more atomization? Or what are its, uh, well, what are the uh, pros and cons there? Well, my feeling is that it's pretty much like radio and television, or for that matter, like automation. You know, the tech, I mean, most of the time, you know, you can't, you want to say 100%, but most of the time, technology doesn't care whether it's used to help people or harm people. It can be used to help people or harm people, but there's very, off, very rarely anything inherent in the technology which requires that one of those results be the case. And I think the information highway, so-called, is like that. Depends who runs it. Uh, as I mentioned, back in the 1920s, late 1920s, there was a battle about who was going to run radio. It settled different ways in different countries. On the case of television, there wasn't even a battle. It just got completely handed over to private power here. Uh, the, uh, uh, on the, when this one, we're now facing another such conflict. If it gets into the hands of private power, we know exactly how it's going to. In fact, they've been telling us. I remember reading an article somewhere, I forget where, I think it may have been the Wall Street Journal or somewhere, talking about the wonders of the information highway. And uh, this is from memory, so I may not have it exactly right, but it was something like this. They were describing the great things that could be done because it was interactive. You know, it's not just passive anymore. Uh, now you can really do things when you're sitting in front of the test. So they said, well, look, the, the two, you know, they said, look, there's two, you know, here's the way it's going to work. And then they gave two examples, one for women and another for men. Uh, for women, it's going to be an incredible home shopping thing. Like, you know, you're sitting there watching some model and she shows you some ridiculous thing and you figure, well, I better have that or my kid won't grow up properly. So now it's interactive. So you can just push a button and, you know, meet, you know, then they send it right over or something like that. So that's the interactive stuff for women. Uh, for men, uh, the example that was given was something like uh, watching the Super Bowl, which every red-blooded male is supposed to be doing. And now it's just passive. You just watch the gladiators fighting. But, you know, the new stuff is going to be interactive. So what they're going to, what they suggest is that before, you know, like while they're in a huddle and getting the instructions from the coach about the next play, uh, they're going to ask everyone in the audience, you know, half all the male population, to which is alive, you know, open to to push to make their own decision, like should it be a pass or a run or you know a kick or something, and then uh, after the play is run, which is completely independent of this, of course, they'll flash on the screen what people thought. So that's going to be for men, you know. Uh, well, you know, that, I may have the example a little bit wrong, but it was some story like that. Yeah, that's the way it's going to go. I mean, it'll be used as a technique for control and manipulation and uh, turning into, you know, mindless consumers of things you don't want and so on and so forth. Yeah, sure, why should uh, those who own the place do anything different? But it doesn't have to be like that. It depends who controls it. If it's controlled by the public, it can be something quite different. It can be a technique of, you know, for example, these, these information processing systems can be methods by which working people can control uh, their own workplace without managers and bosses. Uh, it means that every person, you know, in the workplace can have information in real time, you know, like when it counts. Uh, to make decisions about what ought to be done. Well, that's a very democratizing device. It would wipe out the, you know, the core of the whole system of authority and domination, but it's not going to develop unless, you know, unless uh, people fight for it. I mean, in the 1920s, before this whole media apparatus got so centralized and so capital intensive, there was a place, namely the partisan press, where these sorts of debates could go on. Um, well, where can that debate go on in the, in the age of television, other than like, in small forums well, like you know, this? No, look, I mean, up th you're right. I mean, through, in fact, the late 30s, there was still quite a lively working class and popular press, and, you know, in ethnic communities and labor movement and so on and so forth. Finally got wiped out by, you know, resource concentration, what's called market forces. Uh, so the thing is rebuild it.
You know, uh, let me, I think we're supposed to end now, so let me just end by quoting a genuine conservative, not these guys, not the Newt Gingriches who are statist, you know, statist extremists. Uh, a genuine conservative who was so conservative that Thomas Jefferson wouldn't let his works be read at the University of Virginia when he created it, uh, namely David Hume, uh, uh, an 18th, a major 18th century figure who indeed was a true conservative. Uh, he has a book called Principles of Government, uh, in, or something like that, in which he discusses, uh, he raises in it what, a, what he regards as a, describes as a kind of a paradox of government, and it's very real and very real today, too. Uh, he said, how come, he said, look, if you look at any government in the world, whether it's the most oppressive state or the most free, you always find one constant, namely force is in the hands of the governed. The people who are being ruled, they basically have the force if they get together and use it. So how come they submit to authority, which almost invariably is used to harm them? That's the paradox. And then he says, well, of course, force is, you know, you can control people by force, but he says that's not enough. He says, ultimately, it's opinion. It's through opinion only that the governed submit, meaning thought control. You control people's minds. Uh, you can control them even though they have the power. Well, you know, that's what the struggle for democracy has been all about. And uh, it, sometimes it goes forward, sometimes it goes backwards. The recent years have been going backwards. Uh, but it can go forwards again. Uh, that means, you know, people can, are certainly capable of thinking. They're capable of understanding things. Uh, they need information. They need opportunities. They need forums. They need organizations. Uh, but those are things that are created by human will and human activity. They don't grow out of, uh, you know, they don't come from molecules meeting or cosmological forces. So, you know, people want to create them, they create them. And that can make the difference, exactly as Hume said and indeed feared because he was uh, he didn't want the public to be involved. Professor Chomsky, if I could just make a brief announcement. Sure. Would you be willing to answer the questions sure. of the people who are standing in there? Oh, sure. Nobody more. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. Okay, we got, a, we got a little bit of a relief. The people who are standing there, but nobody more. I can't see how many there are with the light. Four more. Four more. Okay, you guys get your chance. Just make a quick announcement. Yeah. If I could just before that make an announcement, um, there are some there are some response sheets that uh, we've passed out. If before you leave, I just want to make sure we get everybody before you leave. If you could pass them in toward the center aisle because they're extremely important to us for scheduling uh, future guests. Okay and okay, go ahead. Hi, my name is Bruce Crit. I'm a student at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, I never fail to vote. But what, from what you're describing about both the Republican administrations and the Democratic administrations, specifically Clinton, Carter, and Kennedy, as well as the Nixon administration, I wonder, you know, maybe uh, my voting power, my ability to change the system by voting seems a little bit limited. And uh, also, um, of course, the other, the other possibility is just getting in the, the information out, which was something else that you suggested. Um, I mean, even if everybody knew everything that, that you were saying, that you were talking about with regard to the collusion between uh, the capitalists and the, the government of the United States, given the, the separation between uh, policy and politics, um, what, what can we do, even after everybody in the world knows about these things, even if we succeed in telling everybody about all of these things and everybody knew? What do they do? What, I mean, what, specifically, what direct action can the population take? What, what are the most important direct actions that the population can take against this collusion, against this complex? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, uh, with regard to voting, the, I don't think there's a general principle. I mean, you just make your decisions. I don't think it's, it's usually not a major decision, like it's not going to have a big effect on things. It may have some effect on things. Uh, so you just decide, like, is it important enough to, to have an effect in this and that case? And there's no general principle. Uh, but uh, on the other question, what can be done? Well, you know, everything can be done. Everything can be done up to the point of eliminating all structures of authority and repression. They're all create. They're human institutions. They can be dismantled. Uh, if you ask yourself, what's the most important? Well, you know, then 
you know, we, you, that's not the kind of thing you decide in a meeting like this. I mean, those are the kinds of decisions that come by serious thought among people who are really trying to institute change. Now, you know, typically, the, I mean, given the world the way it is, you start with where the world is, okay? Like, you don't start by saying, okay, let's overthrow transnational corporations, okay? Uh, I think that's what, because it's just not within range, you know? So you start with saying, look, here's where the world is. What can we begin to do? Well, you can begin to do things which will get people to understand better what the source of real power is and just how much they can achieve. Like you can start by, say, mo uh, first of all, you can start by getting us to stop torturing people, right? Like there's an easy things to do or getting, you know, stop killing children in Cuba, let's say. Uh, stop, um, you know, massacring in East Timor. Those are easy things. So let's do those. First, do the easy things. Uh, with regard to the domestic scene, take, say, cr the crime bills. I mean, they're just, like I said, they're the domestic equivalent of death squads. Uh, the fact that they're targeting vulnerable populations who are being turned into people under military occupation, look, that's, not, that's an easy one to change. I mean, you really just have to change opinion on that one. Get, you know, that's, it's, it's the, the, you aren't striking at the core of private power when you begin to have a civilized criminal system instead of a brutal, barbaric one. So that one, I think, is changeable. Uh, what about the war against children and families, another case that I mentioned? Well, that's another easy one. I mean, the Anglo, you know, the European-Japanese model, incidentally, it's not, per I don't want to suggest it's so beautiful, and, except in comparison to ours, uh, but those are countries very much like us. You know, they have the same institutions, the same economy, and so on and so forth. They have simply, you know, not been subjected to uh, 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 unilateral business power as much as here for all kind of historical reasons. And we can certainly become like those countries. You know, there's, in fact, a model sitting right in front of you, countries very much like us. Uh, take, say, health care. Well, you know, the U.S. is off the spectrum on that one, too. Again, I think for the same reasons. I mean, even if you just look a couple of miles to the north, there's a country very much like us, which happens to have instituted a semi-civilized, again, plenty of things wrong with it, but a semi-civilized system of health care, not that far back, back in the 1960s, uh, under conditions that we could easily duplicate. Well, those are things that are, I don't want to say those things are going to be easy, but they're within range. Uh, on things like GATT, uh, you're getting into harder territory because here crucial interests of authoritarian institutions are at stake and then you're going to begin to face the fact which after all is a fact that sooner or later you have to face that maybe the most totalitarian institution in human history or certainly close to it is a corporation it's an institution which with in which authority goes strictly from top to bottom if you're in ultimately it's in the hands of owners and investors if you're inside the system, you take orders from above and transmit them down. Uh, if you're outside the system, there are very weak popular controls, which indeed are eroding. Uh, I should say that this is not an in inside of mine. It was pointed out by Thomas Jefferson uh, in his later years uh, when he warned, these are just the early days of corporations, he warned that if, pri if, you, if power was going to shift into the hands of what he called uh, banking institutions and moneyed in corporations, then we then the democratic experiment would be over. We'd be back to an absolute a form of absolutism worse than what they struggled against. Thomas Jefferson is not exactly a figure who's off the spectrum in American, you know, American history. Uh, so you know, this is not a new insight. It's as American as apple pie. We should recognize what Thomas Jefferson could see. In fact, Adam Smith. Uh, but when you see that you realize that it's a hard nut to crack because there, there are enormous agglomerations of power, indeed concentrating and indeed transnational, which are protected from scrutiny or from popular action, and that's got to change. After all, why do corporations have the rights they do? Why are they treated as immortal persons? Uh, contrary to the warnings of people like Adam Smith and others, it was not by law. You know, this was by decisions made in courts and by judges and by lawyers, which simply changed the climate totally. And that can be reversed, too. Uh, institutions can be under popular control, including the economic institutions. Well, you know, organizing to try to achieve that is a much more long-term operation, but it's got to begin somewhere, you know.
So if you ask what should be done, well, you know, I don't think any sane human being can look around the, at the world around them and not figure out things that have to be done. I mean, take a walk through Baltimore, you know, you'll find plenty of things that have to be done. So, you know, you get started doing uh, some of them are broader in scale, so you know you think about those. Uh, but they're not gonna, people. You're not going to do them alone. Like if you take a walk down the streets of Baltimore and you say, "Oh yeah, that ought to be done," nothing's going to happen. On the other hand, if people are organized enough to act about it, yeah, they can achieve things, and there's no particular limit to what they can achieve. I and mean, that's why we don't live under slavery or under feudalism and so on. You mentioned specific organizations that uh, are involved. That, that are involved in breaking apart this collusion. If, even if you, what? I know you can't. I know you can't mention specific actions, but can you mention organizations that are involved in working on this problem specifically? Which problems? The problem of collusion between um, corporations and government. Well, you know, a lot of organizations are involved from different points of view. For example, I mean, like take say at one level, which is important, though of course superficial. Uh, Nader's Public Citizen is involved, but that's important, as I say, but kind of not really touching the structure of power. Uh, beyond that, I mean, any, you know, if the American labor movement ever recovers the insights that ordinary working people, and in fact, the labor movement had 100 years ago, it'll be working against them. You go back 100 years, and in fact, up until much more recently than that, and the major, you know, the major thrust of the labor movement was what was sometimes, you know, industrial democracy placing the workplace under democratic control. I mean, that wasn't, you know, you didn't, they didn't read that in Marx. I mean, everybody figured that out for themselves long before Marx. Uh, and that's the, uh, and he, didn't, he in fact didn't say anything much about it. Uh, the, the, this is, you know, the, so it could be the labor movement, let's say. Uh, and in fact, just about every, you know, any, the, there's tons of activism going on, on usually focused on pretty narrow issues, but they all, Ultimately, they're all talking about illegitimate authority of one form or another. And their interests in, are, are common, and uh, you know, they, just, you, they have to be built up and extended. I mean, I, you know, I, I have my own views as to, if you want some, a list, yeah. you know, it's easy to find. Yes. It's easy to find lots of lists. So if you write to any of the major funding organizations, like, say, Resist in Boston, they'll be delighted to give you a list of the couple hundred groups they funded in the last couple of years. And you will find among them groups involved in anything you can imagine. Or if you go to some, I mean, I'm sure there's some church-based group in either Baltimore or Washington, I don't know the scene well enough, uh, which is a center for, uh, you know, a coordinating center for all kinds of peace and justice activities. And you'll find anything in the world there, just about. Uh, and uh, uh, that happens everywhere. You know. Thank you very much. I just have two questions, and I'm going to sit down. Uh, do you see the uh, American political system hidden for a civil war? And uh, second of all, do you see the uh, bread lines of the Great Depression bringing its head again in, in, in the yeah. uh, contemporary stage in which we live in today? Speaking of the industrial countries, because right. of course in the third right. world it's all right. over. Yeah. Well, uh, with regard to the bread line, first of all, the U.S. has... Uh, I mean, I th last I saw, there are about 30 million people, in the, according to the studies that have been done, about 30 million people are suffering hunger in the United States. Uh, the, uh, take, say, Boston, where I live, uh, which is a very rich city and, in fact, maybe the world's leading medical center. Uh, there's, uh, you know, there are very fancy hospitals, but there's, there's also a hospital that works for, you know, that's the city hospital. So, like, everybody goes to it. Uh, that hospital, which is not a, not a bad hospital, I should say, they... Uh, a couple of years ago, they established a malnutrition clinic uh, because they were beginning, on, after the impact of Reaganism was felt, they were beginning to find in Boston third world levels of malnutrition. And in fact, it got worse over the winter because families had to make a choice. You know, do you let your kids starve or do you let them die of the cold? You know? uh, okay, that's you know, one of the richest cities in the world, major medical center. I mean, bread lines are, if we don't have bread lines, we have the equivalent. Uh, over 30 million people is a lot of people, and that's plenty of children and so on. Uh, and it's going to grow. You know. uh, what about, uh, I mean, it's not starvation like, say, Haiti or you know, Nicaragua or Cuba or something, but it's uh, probably worse than Cuba in many places, but it's, uh, it's real. You know. And it has long-term effects. I mean, when kids are suffering malnutrition, that has a permanent effect. It has an effect on their lives. You know, they'll never get over it. 
Uh, the, uh, and that, that's just criminal in a country as rich as this, or anywhere for that matter. Uh, as to the Civil War, you know, I'm not, I think it's very much up in the air what's going to happen in the United States. There's an experiment going on. The experiment is, can you marginalize a large part of the population, re regard them as superfluous, because they're not helping make those dazzling profits, uh, and c can you set up a world in which production is carried out by the most oppressed people with the fewest rights in the most flexible labor markets, and production is for the rich people of the world? So this can be done internationally now. It's not like the old days when economies are more or less national. So can you get, you know, say, uh, can you get uh, women in China to work in factories where they're locked in and they die in factory fires, you know, because as is happening, incidentally, can you get them to produce the toys that are sold that are sold in stores in New York and Baltimore, uh, where rich people buy them to give them to their children for Christmas? I mean, that's sort of, to give an example, that's a real example, incidentally. Uh, can you have an economy where everything works like that? So production by the most impoverished and exploited for the richest and most privileged, internationally. Uh, and with large parts of the general population just marginalized because they don't contribute to the system. In, say, Colombia, murdered. Uh, in, the New, in New York, locked up in prison, you know, can you do that? Nobody knows the answer to that question. Uh, could it lead to a civil war? It definitely could. It could lead to uprisings, you know, revolts. Uh, there are other things to worry about. Uh, the United States happens to be an extremely fundamentalist country. It's kind of like Iran, sort of, if you look at it. It's a deep, it's a religious fundamentalist country that's, again, off the spectrum in this regard. It's not like other industrial countries. N none come close. Uh, and that's a very dangerous phenomenon, in my opinion. Uh, it, it means that there's deep irrationality, which can be whipped up by demagogues, you know, the Newt Gingriches. These guys can whip up hatred, fear. Uh, you know, they can appeal to religious fundamentalist urges and so on. And that's scary, scaring most of the world, I should say. Uh, if you recall the uh, last Republican National Convention, uh, it opened with a God and Country rally, which was televised. And that was seen around the world. And in Europe, particularly, it really sent chills up people's spines. I mean, they remember the Hitler's Nuremberg rallies. You know, at least older people do. And it had something of that tone. And it's kind of striking, you know, unnatural that the Republicans, I don't mean to say the two parties are all that different. I gave some examples to illustrate the opposite. But there's some difference between them. The Republicans are openly and outspokenly the party of business. They don't make much of a pretense to be anything else. And that means that the only way they can rally the public is behind jingoism, fear, hatred, uh, slander, you know, other techniques which have been used quite effectively to con to organize great masses of people in times of real distress. Uh, we don't have to go back very far in history to find that. Germany in the 1930s was you know, maybe the most civilized and advanced country in the world. All right, it was possible, to, but, but plenty of problems. Uh, and it was possible to whip up hatred, fear, uh, uh, and to mobilize people, and in fact, to carry out certain, you know, what from their point of view was social development even. Uh, and, you know, with consequences that you're familiar with. Uh, yeah, that could, you know, why are we different? We've got the same genes. Uh, and the conditions in the culture that uh, might be part of the background for that, they exist. On the other hand, there are other things. Uh, it, this is, uh, you know, uh, th there's a streak of independence and opposition to authority in the United States, which is maybe also unique in the world. That's a very healthy thing. It can show up in antisocial ways, like running around with assault rifles, but it could also show up in healthy ways. Uh, and the trick is to make it show up in healthy ways, like opposition to illegitimate authority, which it could do. Uh, this is maybe the country in the world that most protects freedom of speech. I happen to think that's a very good thing. I know a lot of people don't agree, but I, th I think it is. And that was won by centuries of struggle. I mean, freedom of speech was achieved in the United States, really, through the Civil Rights Movement, which finally got the Supreme Court to uh, knock down the centuries-old laws against uh, criticism of state power. That came right through the Civil Rights Movement. 
uh, well, you know, those are gains that are real and that offer a basis for doing things. So, you know, it's complicated. Uh, yeah, could it be a civil war? It could be very unpleasant. A lot of very, un very ugly things could happen. They're not inconceivable, but they're also not inevitable. How you doing? Uh, my Hi. name is Albert Wood. Uh, my question uh, is a what question. You uh, studied linguistics, so that means, uh, I guess, language and as an extension communication. Uh, one of the biggest problems, or the biggest problem, is communication. Most people don't understand each other, don't hear each other, don't listen to each other, more importantly than anything else. Uh, what do you think are some ways of getting people to, uh, like, where to choir? How do we reach other people, because we have basic understandings, we all appreciate the same ideas, just we use different words to uh, express ourselves. How do we reach the average person out there when the mass media is controlled, so the TV and the radio are out, uh, sure you got the home computer and you got more coffee shops than a little bit and Kinko's open 24 hours a day, but most of the people can't read the information and even more of them don't understand what they've read. Yeah. What are you, some of your ideas, because I work with an organization that is trying to, uh, to, to reach people uh, better on a, on a common level to uh, 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 just to do just that. Yeah. Thank you. Well, first of all, let me just, I think, one preliminary point. Uh, I'll answer that question as a human being, in which I have no more to say about it than you do, but I'm not going to answer it as a linguist, because linguistics tells you it's zero about that topic. Uh, and in fact, that point can generalize. Take any question of human significance, and uh, the fact of the matter is there's very little understanding about it. Uh, nothing, very little in the sciences or the, th I mean, you know, people pretend otherwise. That's for power reasons and career reasons and so on. But outside of a very small number of areas like physics and mathematics and a actually linguistics is one of them, uh, outside of extremely small number of areas which usually, which, which happen to deal not with problems of immediate human significance, uh, the level of understanding is fairly shallow, meaning it's as accessible to, it's accessible to everybody, you know. Like, I learned a lot of the stuff I know from people who never went to school, you know, uh, and it's standard, because the level of understanding is just not that profound. So you, you're not going to go to the sciences or to, you know, to find answers to these questions. Uh, you, you can get uh, pretenses from, you know, the educated sectors about answers, but not the only pretenses. You, you know the answer to your question as well as I do. So, you know, we, you and I can talk about what to do about it, and I got no more to say than you do. And in fact, I don't think there are any tricks. Uh, it seems to me the tricks are the old ones. Uh, if there are any new ideas, they've been kept a deep, dark secret. I mean, organization is a hard job. You know, it begins by getting people to break, be willing to, I mean, let's take, say, places that are much worse off than we are. Like take, say, Latin America, you know, where the suffering is much worse than here. Well, you know, back in the 1960s and 70s, uh, elements of the church the churches did begin to face this problem and they began in a pretty sensible way dealing with the culture as it existed so uh, you most should know the story it's an important one uh, they began by setting up uh, community going in peasant society in among peasants or you know workers or whatever uh, women any group uh, they started by setting up you know what came to be called base communities where people would do things like read the gospels you know and think, talk to each other about what it really meant, you know, and then work on the things, you know. I mean, I remember seeing some of these base communities where they were trying to get people to get, to get peasant societies are often very hostile, you know. And one that I went to, they, they, there was a, actually a very conservative order of nuns uh, were trying to get local peasants to agree to work together enough so that they could get a common well, okay. You know, instead of each going out with a cup of water to try to pick something up from the, uh, you know, stream. Well, you know, that's, uh, that was hard. Uh, and it, 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 when it's done, you can go on to bigger things. I mean, it got to a point in Central America where you and I uh, had to spend our tax money to have these people murdered, because that's what happened in the 80s. There was a big war fought to destroy the people who were trying to do that. You know, it's symbolic. That it, but real, that the decade started with the assassination of an archbishop and ended with the assassination of Jesuit intellectuals, uh, all by forces armed, trained, and paid for by you and me. You know? uh, and what happened in between was just more slaughters and terror and massacre because people were doing 
we're answering the kind of question that you're asking, but under much harder circumstances. We don't face those circumstances. And what, uh, you know, organizers, including priests and nuns and others, did in Latin America, we don't face those problems. It's a lot easier for us. And I don't know of any tricks that they didn't figure out or that haven't been figured out through history. It's just a matter of going out and doing it. You want to organize people? Fine, you go organize people. I mean, I, I, somebody, the first questioner raised the question of East Timor. Boy, if you can think of a case that would be hard to get people interested in, that's one. You know, uh, Americans, by and large, don't even know that Canada exists, you know, let alone that uh, East Timor exists, you know. Uh, but uh, so this went on in secret, you know, nobody was interested. Everybody in power wanted it to go on. But a half a dozen or so people finally managed to break through. How? By the ordinary techniques that we all know about, you know lobbying, organizing, pressure groups, uh, letter writing, um, you know, everything. You know. That's the way you do it. There are no other ways. Two quick questions. Um, first, what is the political ramification of the crime bill? Crime bill? Yes, as it relates to the, the new world. One? The new crime the new, bill. The new crime bill. Right, as it relates to the world order. And also, what is the relation of the world order to uh, the family value that is being charted across America? That is being? Charted across America. Across America? Right. Well, I don't really have a lot to add to what I said before. I mean, just to summarize, the, uh, I mean, the crime bill, I think, is a natural reaction on the part of uh, the people who sort of own the society to the problem of a lot of superfluous people around who aren't making profits for them. Uh, well, a natural reaction, if, you, if you're living in El Salvador or El Colombia or someplace like that, a natural reaction is actually what they call down there social cleansing. Uh, you send out the security forces to just murder people in the streets, like the Brazilian police, you know, where we had this success story of American-style capitalism. Uh, one of the parts of the success story is the Brazilian police just go out and murder street children. You know, they murder them, that's all. Okay, it takes care of that problem. Uh, here, the crime bill, I think, fulfills a similar objective. It controls parts of the population that are defenseless, so you don't have to worry about them, uh, and that uh, are superfluous in the sense that they're not contributing to profits. Uh, that's a definite part of the New World Order, because the New World Order is turning most of the world into two-tiered societies, you know, with little sectors of wealth and a large mass of poverty, and you've got to control them. So that's the crime bill. Family values, yeah, I mean, it's just, I think it's just what I said. It's just what the UNICEF, I mean, not, not me, what the UNICEF report described. Again, very mainstream report I was quoting. There has indeed been a war in the United States and England, uh, and to some extent the other Anglo-American societies, like even as far as New Zealand. Uh, there's been a war against families and against children uh, because uh, human values are being, as part of the general attack on human sentiments and human values, which, remember, are inconsistent with capitalism. Now, you know, we don't have a capitalist society. As I said, it's a very, you know, the wealthy want a real powerful state to defend them. A capitalist society wouldn't survive for five minutes. But we're sort of off toward the capitalist end of the spectrum. And in a capitalist society, if it was pure, your rights would be what you can earn in the market, period. You don't have any other rights. Uh, and since we're sort of off to that end of the spectrum and we try to impose those values on essentially defenseless and vulnerable people, okay, uh, children don't have the right to be with their parents. Parents don't have the right to take care of their children because you don't get that. That's, that's a human right. You don't win, that right isn't conferred by the labor market. Therefore, it doesn't exist. Uh, so uh, therefore, the design of policies happens to be such as to undermine those rights. It's kind of irrelevant if you don't have rights other than those you win on the market. So the fact that these societies led the war against children and families is understandable and not pretty, uh, particularly when you think that these are the most advantaged societies in the world. I mean, we're the richest country in the world, just by a long shot. There's nobody who comes close. You know, you take a look, take a look at the natural advantages of the United States in terms of resources and opportunities and so on. There's just no one close. You know, I mean, once the native population was exterminated and eliminated, you just had this extraordinarily rich place, you know, unparalleled wealth. 
Uh, you know, that you had slaves to build it to keep cotton cheap for you, you know, so you could have an industrial revolution. Uh, everything, you know, capital flowing in, no enemies. I mean, just happened to be, you know, kind of an ideal place to become very rich and powerful and wealthy, and we're way beyond anyone else. Uh, so the fact that we have these problems is, you know, it's bad enough that anyone does, but, you know, the fact that we have them is an absolute disgrace. What it shows is that the system is a social and economic system is a catastrophic failure. And it doesn't have to be. You know, we have the resources to make it better. But of course, left alone, it's going to work towards undermining values that uh, don't uh, express themselves as commodities on the labor market, on the market. And that includes, like, relations between parents and children. So usual question, do we decide to let it happen? Monday's live discussion and call-in, Wall Street Journal columnist Paul Jago and Baltimore Sun columnist Jack Germond examined the weekend's major news stories. They talk politics and preview Tuesday's elections. Paul Jago and Jack Germond will be with us Monday morning at 8 Eastern Time, 5 Pacific. Sunday on Book Notes, Bill